Okay, we're gonna go live on the on YouTube. Okay, hello everybody again. <laughs> and uh, for those who are online, we start with this conference. I would like to welcome you in the name of the UIAA. You will hear from Stephanie in a few moments more about it. I'm the um, president of the Medical Commission of the UIAA, and we together we uh, tried to organize this um, conference. You will hear later why we did this or what is our intention. For me, it's very nice that we have, um, we have very famous people here. And uh, we have not so famous people here, it's also very nice. <laughs> but um, for sure, you will hear the story behind this day later. And I think it's a very nice story. And for sure, in the evening, we have a lot of time to discuss. Uh, we, we sit together, we talk to each other, and then you will maybe figure out more about this conference. One official thing I would like to say, uh, it's I would like to thank the Swiss Society of Mountain Medicine. You will hear later also from Corina, from the president. And I would like to say, thank the Swiss Alpine Club. And I would like to thank the UIAA and the Swiss Society Sport, uh, Sports Medicine Clinic, because they did uh, give us a, a little bit of the money that we can organize it. All the doctors inside here, they know that the medical conference for 80 switch francs is really cheap. <laughs> so you will also see that these people are online. They didn't have to pay because it's just too complicated for us to collect money and uh, make all the lists because we are working voluntarily. So it's not like somebody emailed me and they said, well, who is organizing conference? And yet it's me. But I, it's not my job. I work as a doctor, as you. So I do this in the evening, voluntary. Mm -hmm. So for those who are online, we ask them to donate something, what they think is appropriate. We, it's going into the, 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 we have some a project in the UIA to support uh, mountain workers, things like this. So you will hear from this maybe later on, or if you want to know it, you go to the <laughs> website. If there are no, important question about housekeeping or whatever, then I will be sitting behind and hoping that all the people are coming. And now please, yeah, Stephanie. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm just going to explain a little bit about the UIAA. I don't want to be in front of the screen here. Uh, Urs asked me to, <laughs> Urs asked me to put a small speech together. I uh, tried to do it in just a few slides to let you know the UIA does a lot of things. Uh, let's go forward. And okay, um, just to go back one. Okay, I can't do that, but that's okay. Um, if I can describe the UIA briefly, I can put it into three pillars. We have the safety, sustainability, and uh, sport. Um, in the three pillars, we have our commissions. And um, we have nine commissions. And the commissions are made up of about 200 international experts in their field. And like Ur said, they're all volunteers. If we look at our sports pillar, we have ice climbing and we have lot, we have an ice climbing world tour and the ice climbing works closely with our youth. We have some youth events in it. Uh, there's two disciplines in the ice climbing lead and speed. These are all live streamed um, on the, on computer so you can watch it on your computer at home. Our calendar 2022-2023 will be released soon. And the events are all over the world. So maybe you want to check our website and see if you can attend one live. And if not, you can check one out live stream. Uh, one other core uh, important thing about the UIAA is just sustainability. Uh, the protection of the mountains and our environment has always been um, a chief concern for the UIAA. And today, that commitment is as strong as ever. We have a, a climate change task force whose main goals 
uh, are making recommendations for the best practices for going to the mountains and also how we can offset or reduce our carbon, carbon footprint. Uh, we also have a safety commission. Our safety commission is composed of manufacturers of climbing and mountaineering equipment. We have accredited laboratories and again, as well, our independent expert volunteers. Um, they meet annually twice a year. These are some of the working groups that we have going on at the moment. And we have the UIAA safety label. Maybe some of you know this label. You'll find it on your climbing and mountaineering gear. When you see this label, you know that you have these experts looking at it to make sure that your your gear is um, as as high as a standard as it can be. And you're also supporting the working groups who are, who are volunteering on all these uh, projects during the year to make sure our uh, climbing gear is safe. Uh, we also have training and training is also one of the core services offered by the UIAA. We have a mountain qualification label and this is um, internationally recognized certification, which examines and evaluates the training and assessment programs of our UIAA member federations. And lastly, under our safety, we have mountain medicine. Uh, we have two uh, videos that Urs has uh, really helped start and set up. We'll watch one of them shortly. I think uh, an interesting one would be uh, the high altitude, um, as we are all at 3,000 meters, and some of us felt it this morning or last night. So I have some information, a short little video we can watch on that. Um, also, the UIA Medical Commission, they produce uh, comprehensive recommendation papers. These papers are translated into many, many, many different languages. And one of the ones is what we are all here for today, and that is uh, Women in Altitude. And I'm going to show quickly our uh, short video on uh, high altitude. A group of climbers is ascending a peak. Higher they climb, the more the air pressure decreases. With a decrease in air pressure, less and less oxygen is available. This increases the climbers' heart rates and makes their breathing faster. Due to insufficient acclimatization, some of the climbers get ill. They suffer from symptoms of acute mountain sickness, AMS, including headaches and a change in appetite. Some suffer from dizziness and others from nausea. Eager as they are, the group ignores these symptoms and keeps climbing. They are not aware that ANS can progress to high-altitude cerebral edema, or HACE. In short, brain functioning is impaired. When this happens, walking becomes uncoordinated, a strong headache will emerge, and climbers may also appear confused. The group is unaware of another altitude illness, namely high-altitude pulmonary edema, or HACE which can emerge independently or simultaneously with the previous two. The lungs begin to suffer badly, breathing is difficult and makes a rattling noise, coughing increases and performance levels suffer severely. These symptoms are clear red flags which urge you to descend immediately. Whether suffering from haste, hate or ANS, reaching the summit and returning safely to the valley seems highly unlikely. The key remedy is to descend. The climbers should take appropriate medication and may need additional treatment, such as time in a hyperbaric bag or receiving extra oxygen. However, these options should only be used to enable safe descent. Could this have been avoided? Well, yes. Look at this team further down the mountain. They took a slower and much more careful approach, and their climbers were well acclimatized. Some pre-acclimatized at sea level in a hypoxic tent, which simulates high altitude conditions. Note that further experience is needed to devise optimal protocols to use this method. Others are climatized for several days at 2,500 meters above sea level, taking day tours. When they started their ascent, they took it slowly. At 3,000 meters and higher above sea level, they slept at progressively higher altitudes, never more than about 500 meters higher than the night before. Every three to four days, they also took one day to rest. As a result, they acclimatized, greatly reduced the risk of altitude illness, and reached the top. 
That's responsible climbing. So next time you plan a high climb, plan well, go slowly, and include an extra day of rest. <laughs> so that video was produced by the UIAA uh, Medical Commission, and if you want to share that link, uh, you're welcome to. I can send it to all the uh, every all the participants uh, with an email. So thank you very much. What I forgot to say is uh, I also want would like to thank Sam um, Shocklin and uh, Susie. They are uh, responsible for the scientific part of the meeting. So if you have any question about the scientific meeting, ask them. <laughs> oh, so it seems that it's my turn. Yes. <laughs> Oh, it's your turn. Yeah. <laughs> take my take my slide. Is it okay with this? It's not a problem. I don't have any slides. <laughs> okay. Thank you both very much for the invitation to say some uh, welcome words today. It's a pleasure for me to welcome all of you here on the Diaboletsa Hut in the canton of Graubünden in Switzerland. Graubünden, I don't know who of you knows this place, is a big canton of Switzerland. It's more than 7,000 square kilometers. And we have a lot of mountains, we have a lot of valleys, and I'm always happy there are not so many inhabitants. There are just around 200,000. And um, yeah, more of the uh, around 40% yeah, of them are living higher than 1,000 meters. And the highest point of the canton is the uh, uh, Fitzbernina with more than 4,000 meters. So this altitude things also plays a role here. Okay, concerning the topic of today, going to altitude, um, I could tell you something about medical things, but I think there are a lot of people speaking about this today. I also could tell a little bit about history of women going to the mountains or mountain guide. Being a woman, this is also more and more often the case. But I would like to tell you a short story about my personal history, my mountain history. Uh, it was about 12 or 13 years ago when I did a first course in mountaineering organized by the Swiss Alpine Club. Already then, it was a course just for women. But there was one man, the mountain guide, because uh, his wife, she was also a mountain guide, she was pregnant and wasn't able to do this course. Yeah, and after this course, one of the participants and me, we planned to climb the Blumis Alp in the Venice Oberland. And we uh, organized this mountain guide for this tour. But we decided that we want to do another tour on our own the day before. So we decided to climb the Wilde Frau. Uh, Wilde Frau. It's a smaller mountain. Uh, in front of the Blumis Alp. And so we arrived one day earlier, and in the evening at dinner, we had to realize okay, <clears throat> yeah, a lot of people, it was a weekend, but we were the only female road team. There were a lot of males, there were a lot of mixed teams, but we were the only one being just females. And I was sitting there and thought, hmm. This is somehow special. I was a little bit surprised because until then I already knew it that I go to the mountains with, with women. And um, I saw some people watching us and I thought, okay, what are they thinking about us? What will we do? Yeah, the next day we did this tour and everything went fine. And um, I can say we were also a little bit proud that everything was fine. And um, yeah, so also the women are able to do this on their own. And uh, if we have a look at the numbers of the Swiss Alpine Club today, um, there are more than 40% uh, being women. And uh, my personal point of view is if you go outside, there are still not so many female women. You see them here and there, but uh, it's still the, the main or the, the most thing you see that there are male teams, that there are mixed teams, 
And I must say, sometimes I can understand it that you go with your partner or with a mountain guide because sometimes you want to do bigger things and perhaps it's not able with your female colleagues, but somehow it's a little bit tricky. On the other side, if we have a look at Switzerland, I, I mean, I can say the most things about this. There are a lot of women in leading positions in, yeah, so to say, institutes, uh, yeah, being in, in uh, while dealing with mountain things. So, except for me, there's the Monika Brodmann as the president of the International Society of Mountain Medicine. There's the Rita Christen as the president of the um, Swiss Association of Mountain Guides. There's the Yasmin Minat being the president of the Grimm, the um, mountain medicine group in the French speaking part of Switzerland. There's Eliana Knutli and me as the heads of the medical section of the Alpine Rescue Switzerland. There's Natalie Hölzel and uh, Alison Sheets as the vice presidents of the medical section of the um, ICA, the International Commission of Alpine Rescue. And if you look, one second. <laughs> there. Into the past, there was also a female president of the Swiss Alpine Club. So you see there are a lot of women and that's cool. And that's the end of my short introduction today. So um, yeah, I'm happy to be here and I wish all of you a lot of uh, fun and two nice, interesting guests. Oh, <laughs> I'm almost so sure now. It will work. So um, <laughs> this is <laughs> this is my brother Yeltsin Sherpa from um, Luka Hospital. This is Sonaputi Sherpa, Yeltsin's boy. And this is Dr. Angani Sherpa, the doctor, medical doctor, MDGP, who works right now in a very low level hospital in the Terra region. And uh, she is already teaching MDGP. So, welcome. Yeah. The respect of this group that both of them are wearing the Sherpa dresses. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So, um, I'm Monica Brotman. I'm the president of the International Society of Mountain Medicine. I was elected before COVID. I had a part of my time during COVID. Um, Linda was even worse with her presidency of WMS, so I'm still glad that we could at least organize a hybrid or virtual uh, World Congress in Interlaken. Uh, I will just tell you a bit about uh, the women that are important for me. Maybe I'll take the mouse. mouse. Yeah. So, ancient times. Um, I remember myself when I started climbing, I did not wear robes as these women do, but I was wearing men's clothes. Maybe some of you remember that the jackets were so long and came up to here and were like this. So they were not yet even clothes for women. This changed a bit, but just remember that these are pictures between 1870 and 1910, and so it's not so far away from, from ourselves. And these are mostly pictures from uh, a wonderful exhibition that was in the Swiss Alpine Museum in Bern um, a few days ago, a few hours ago. So, oops. Excellent. Nico Niki, she has been our first female Swiss mountain guide. She made her diploma in 1986. Um, she climbed huge mountains. She was on Everest. She was in K2. Um, fortunately came down from K2 uh, because she realized that she wouldn't do it. And um, when now we talk about Nico Niki, it's also this one. This one. Great. Because of Passan Lamonika Niki Hospital, and I will show you a very short video at the end. For technical reasons, I will take it at the end. Um, when you combine the name of um, Nikol Niki and Passan Lamu, you will come to Passan Lamu. 
Sherpa, who was the first Nepalese woman to climb Everest. Unfortunately, she died on her way back. But she or her family, together with uh, Nico Niki, founded a hospital in Lukla, which is about the altitude here. It's about 2,800 meters. And you will see the, the hospital video afterwards. I go again to Nepal. Uh, this is Lakpa Putti Sherpa. She was together with um, Pasang Lamu Sherpa on this first female expedition to Everest. Um, unfortunately, she did not climb the summit because the expedition stopped after uh, Pasang Lamu's death. But she uh, is also a very good friend or a sister of mine. And she introduced me also to these three very strong um, Sherpa women with whom I had the privilege to have an expedition on a 7,000 meters peak um, a few years ago. And you see even Nicole was there. In the meantime, she had had a very severe accident. She's in wheelchair, but she joined us on an expedition. It was called the Sisters Expedition. And it was really a marvelous expedition where everybody came safely and healthily home. Uh, we did not do the peak, but I think we were really successful. That's where I get to know Pasang Lamu Sherpa Akita, the climber. They are a very young but very strong Sherpa climber, and she now is on their way on her way to do all the 8,000 meters peaks, probably 14, 8,000 meters. And now you see what she has already done. She was in K2 in the first female expedition for K2. She was the first Nepalese woman on K2. So she is really doing a lot of, of, of progress now. And I think it's a wonderful um, example also how, how women can go on. And then only recently, I had the chance to meet you, mm -hmm. Susmita. Mm -hmm. And um, thanks also to um, uh, my sister, Lakputi Sherpa. And you are the first Nepalese woman to climb all seven summits. Congratulations. And by chance, her husband, Birat, he is a doctor, a medical doctor, an emergency physician. And uh, they are here with their beautiful children. Thanks for being here also. And um, for now, I want to close with the SWORD video, but first of all, I would like to congratulate and thank you a lot, Urs and Stephanie, for organizing uh, this conference. Have you realized that it's probably my first conference where there is just one man on the podium? <laughs> I don't know who of you has ever experienced such a thing. And it's wonderful that you did it. Thank you very much. And now I leave you with the video about um, Nico Niki Pasanglamo uh, Hospital in Lukla, Nepal. Okay, so a very remote area. It's mountainous. It's uh, a road from the city. And the life in Lukla for people who is staying the whole year is very hard. It's a hard life. Life is not easy. We ask to the people what what do they need? A school, a monastery, and they say no, a hospital. Then we decide to follow their wish and to build the hospital in Lukla. There is a lot of people who are giving birth um, at home and this is a big, big problem. The most important issue is the problem of hygiene. Of course, if you are giving birth at home, uh, it's not clean. And to reduce mortality of uh, mother and children, it was necessary to build the hospital. There are two Nepali doctors in the hospital. 
one shoot doctor and one assistant. Usually five nurses, one pharmacist, two in laboratory, and one responsible for X-ray. It's not usual that the people stay at the hospital. The people is coming just for OPD. It's just for a consultation in the daytime. Then they are going back home. The women who are giving delivery, they have to stay at least one night. And of course, it's paid. Everything is paid by birth. We have approximately one birth a week, which means 52 births in a year. The people of the valley, they trust now in the hospital. They are making more days of working to come to the hospital. And they know that for children, be five years old, it's free, of course. The poor patient, of course, they have nothing to pay. And for the patient who can pay, they have to pay 100 rupees for the consultation, which is um, one six pounds, one dollar. We want the hospital to be accessible to everyone, especially the poor people. Yeah, great. We want to introduce you to Tanya Bischofsberger. She is a mountaineer, but she's also uh, involved uh, very much in the Swiss Alpine Club. Thank yeah. you to be here. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm in, the com in a central committee of the Swiss Alpine Club. I'm happy to be here today. And when I asked, asked Urs um, if I have to prepare something, he said, no, 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 just come over and say hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I still I thought I'd take this opportunity to refresh my English. It's been a long time ago. I spoke last time English, so a few words you have to listen. So the Swiss Alpine Club and women, that's a long story. Uh, I don't know if someone knows about it. Uh, the Alpine, Swiss Alpine Club got in 1863 by 35 men. They uh, put up or they they had st statues, statues, mm -hmm. yeah. And there it was written that Schweizer and Schweizer Einwohner, Swiss and inhabitants of Switzerland, can be member of the Swiss Alpine Club. Schweizer, the German uh, language is not that easy as the English language, so it's not. Schweizer is Swiss, yeah, but only the main. <coughs> so it was the start for more than 100 years discussions if uh, <coughs> the statues uh, were also allowing women to enter or not. Um, some local groups, they let in women. Women could be members of some local groups. Others said no, just men. <coughs> and the Central Committee discussed, uh, the local groups discussed Finally, in 1907, it was clear that the women got um, exposed, or how do you say, they were not allowed to be members. Huh? They voted on that, the men, and then from then on, it was not allowed anymore, also but not for the local groups. And that didn't, that didn't prevent the women from going to mountain. To the mountains, and so a few years later, they uh, founded the Swiss Women Alpine Club. That was in 1917 or 18. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it's years of this discuss discussions followed because it was some uh, local groups wanted that uh, to allow again women, some not, and it was until 1980. So not more than 40 years ago that they merged and finally also women were allowed to be part of the Swiss Alpine Club. Yeah, since then, we heard it already. Um, they they catched up. Um, 40, more than 40 persons are now women. A bit missing in the, or the guides and, and leaders. Not, not, uh, not that, yeah. The numbers there are not yet so good. But. We are working on it. Um, 
The Swiss Alpine Club does also support uh, young mountaineers and has a program called uh, Expedi Expeditions Team. It's team an expedition team. That's a training course for young mountaineers, um, like between 18 and 25 or up to 30 years old. It, it, it has, has a duration of three years. And in 2018, we had the first only female expedition team. And now the second one is in, a, in the training. And I'm sure we will hear in the future from those girls, young women, um, going then also to high altitude. They have a, they learn a lot of, of expeditions. They go also on expeditions. And yeah, I'm sure we will hear of them in the near future. So thank you for organizing this event. And yeah, enjoy this afternoon. That was all. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very impressed already now. And it's, it's just exceptional that only women stand here and tell their stories. I mean, we know that men are necessary for many things, but, <laughs> <laughs> but for this time, it, it's really <laughs> nice to have this work done like this and have an international, you know, audience as well. And I want to introduce the next international uh, person that was very, very important to build up female mountaineering medicine in, uh, in the UIA, that's Helen Mayer. And, you know, the nice thing of her is that she is a medical doctor. That's why she was, uh, you know, selected in this committee. And I don't say more than that. Helen, you tell us the history of why we are all here now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, I'm from the Netherlands. I come from less than z uh, zero meters. <laughs> I've written down my speech <laughs> because I'm suffering a bit from the hypoxia. <laughs> and um, well, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to this symposium. I think a very important symposium. And as I was involved in the first recommendations by the RIA about women and altitude, uh, I feel, feel, feel very privileged to be here. And I want to tell you a little bit about how we got started. I and we in the UI Medcom about this on this subject. Uh, women and altitude. Well, I was 16 when I did my very first mountaineering course here in Switzerland in Kandestek in the International Scout Center. I was the very first and only female at that moment. <laughs> Everybody was astonished. And uh, uh, I felt quite normal being a woman and wondered why there weren't it, weren't it anymore. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then, of course, a little bit later, I started to study medicine at the University in Amsterdam. And then the two combined and mountain medicine uh, became important to me. Um, there's in medicine, there is uh, still too little attention, was and still is too little attention to the difference between the physiology between men and women. Uh, as physicians, we are taught that to treat patients identically, but similar treatment can lead to dissimilar health. Uh, for years, Men were used as the model for every clinical study, and it was assumed that the results and suggested treatments should and would be the same for women. Since the early 90s, many, early 90s, uh, more and more studies appeared where women were included. And this inclusion led to the discovery that women bodies respond quite differently from the male body in about every aspect. This applies to medicine in general, in all its different specialities, and then also applies to mountain medicine. And then why women altitude? Well, it was a sort of hobby of mine. And um, uh, as I prefer nowadays to call it female specific medicine, mountain medicine. Uh -huh. um, I started my training in Amsterdam in 1972. Women were still rare at university in the 
medical faculty. We were 20% that very first day of my very first year. And the professor who taught us uh, told us a very special day. Never had there been that many women in the hearing uh, where, we, where we were at that moment. Uh, at, at the moment, it's more than two thirds females studying medicine. Um, and as a medical student, I, I had ex uh, discovered mountaineering. I endeavored myself uh, and, uh, in all the books I could find about mountains and, and mountaineers and uh, sometimes wondering why there was so, li so little about women. And um, can I have the <coughs> next slide, please? Is it this thing? Yeah? That's my seat. Nothing happens. Yeah, yeah. This yeah, it's still it works, it works. Well, it's me and I have no conflict of interest. Uh, then, uh, uh, there's definitely some difference between women and men. For example, this. And uh, then, uh, come on. Uh, and, uh, I was so glad when I found this first book. Uh, about Jana Imink, who lived in the late 19th century, a Dutch climber who climbed a lot in the Dolomites and which by the local mountain guides then was called the Dutch miracle climber. She lived there about five years, climbed more than 70 peaks, which had never been named or climbed before. There's even one peak named after her, Sina Imink. And um, she wore trousers, which was much spoken about. <laughs> uh, and then I discovered another book, Women on the Rope, and I really like that. It's by Cicely Williams in 1973, a climber herself, and going through the whole history of women climbers, about how the first woman who climbs, Matterhorn, was an Italian daughter of a mountain guide, and she specially sewn in the seam of her skirt all kinds of little rings where she did a little rope through so she could tighten that if the wind blew. <laughs> Um, I try to uh, find as much as possible to read on mountaineering and mountain medicine. Did not find much. I did not find much in mountain medicine and women, and almost nothing in mountain medicine and women. Um, the first book I discovered on mountain medicine were the published uh, proceedings of the British Alpine Club in 1975. I've touched something, I guess. This. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, and those, this was edited by Charles Clark, Michael Ward and Edward Williams, well-known names in mountain medicine in the years to follow, and could be considered as the founders of the first informal UIAA MedCom, which officially was later founded in 1981. Sorry, sorry. Special was in this book, the chapter that was the very, very, very last chapter on the very, very last page in the very, very last sentence. <laughs> the, the only word, woman. <laughs> Talking about cystitis and thrush. <laughs> um, that's the very first mention on ma female mountain medicine in literature. Um, in the mid 70s, I joined the Medical Commission of the Dutch Mountaineering Association. And in 1987, a friend of mine became member of the very first Dutch female, all-female expedition to Chamlang in Nepal. Uh, an all-female expedition because they wanted to be able to make their own decisions and be in the lead when they wanted to, and not only when the men permitted them. Summit. They summited, yes, all of them. <laughs> Uh, and I became the Dutch representative of the official UIA in Medcom in the mid 80s. And in the years to follow, this commission got more and more female members. These are several meetings we had in Aachen, Plassiebrennen, in uh, Avimor, in Kathmandu. More and more women were present. And what did we do in the UIA Medcom? Well, at least we tried to meet every time we met with the UI Medcom with, with, the, with the female members. And then Dominique Jean from France in September 2003 
wrote the very first manuscript on women and altitude which was then presented at the Copenhagen meeting of the UIAA Medcom by Conchita Leal from Spain. And uh, Dominique and Conchita and myself worked further on making an UIAA Medcom consensus statement about the subject. And the final version was approved at the Tehran UIAA Medcom meeting in 2004 of which the shortened version for the UIA website was finalized in 2006. An update in 2008 under the title, Women Going to Altitude. In the meantime, an international group consisting of Dominique Chan from France and Conchita Leal from Spain, Susie Krimlobus from Switzerland, Lorna Moore from the USA and myself from the Netherlands, worked on an ex a more extensive article on the subject, which was then published under the title, recommendations for women going to altitude in the high altitude medicine biology in 2005 and in 2008 david hillebrand and myself wrote a paper on about contraception and period control at altitude which was presented and approved as the consensus statement in by the Kathmandu uia medcom meeting in april 2009 published on the uia west also much cited, copied and translated since then. We hoped and expected that the role of women in mountain medicine would change from the odd one out to one of an enriching discovery of remarkable differences in the physiology of women and men in normal health, as well as in the response to the same circumstances. Female orientated trials like the Framingham study in Massachusetts has revealed that women can benefit from new treatment options tailored by the female body as new medications to help women disease. Concentrating on gender specific biology could explain why, although women develop more debilitating diseases than men do, they actually live six to seven years longer. These discoveries opened the gateway to a new science called gender medicine, gender specific medicine. Not everywhere in the world that landed. <laughs> Much to my surprise, in 2010, I was asked to write a contribution for a book called Moderne Bergen, about women in altitude. And without my knowledge, come on. Yeah. Yes. Without my knowledge, into the chapter, special groups of persons. <laughs> which also included the theme children and elderly. It was published consisting just of these, these three themes together, 19 pages in a more than 710 pages thick book. Oh, it's turned around. Okay. I cannot deeply go into everything, of course, of gender specific medicine, but I will just mention some everyday examples. Um, There are profoundly significant sex differences in the therapeutic power of drugs and their side effects. Oh, uh, doctors often misdiagnose heart attacks in women because the symptoms in women are not as easily recognized, like the crushing chest pain characteristically seen in men where women have more stomach pain, out of breath, nausea. And women are more likely to die of sudden death when they take the same anti medications that work so well for men. The electrical properties of the heart are different from between the sexes and the mechanism of heart failure are gender specific. And the metabolism, the enzymes in the female body can differ from the men's effect how well or how poorly substances are metabolized. For example, women get drunk faster than men, are more likely to become alcoholics because the female body cannot rid the, in the bloodstream the alcohol as efficient as in the male body. Or the byproducts of tobacco, such as nicotine, are particularly destructive in women. The inability of the female body to metabolize and rid the body of many of the negative substances in cigarettes has resulted in a higher incidence of lung cancer among uh, women 
And there's evidence that women metabolize pain relief drugs differently according to age and where they are in their menstrual cycle. Uh, although women are victim uh, of osteoporosis more than men, men will also suffer from osteoporosis and should be aware of this fact. Men have less vigorous, vigorous immune systems than women's and are less able to fight off some types of infection. This led to new insight, for example, in arthritis, systemic lupus, hematosis, multiple sclerosis, and in COVID-19 even. The, there has been research about the oestrogen benefits to bone strength, heart health, and brain functions, and possible protection from colon cancer and cataracts. A hot field of pharmaceutical research is developing new designed oestrogen that bring women some of the benefits of oestrogen while eliminating the risk of breast cancer that comes with long-term estrogen exposure. The theoretical yeah, the theoretical suspected increase of potential serious ectopic pregnancy and pelvic infection, infection in copper IUDs use was never proven. Uh, in general, men respond better to medication for headaches than antidepressants. In women, those responses can differ dramatically. However, whereas women are more sensitive into fluctuations in serotonin, they actually respond better to SSRIs. Women weaker than men? It's untrue that women are the weaker sex. Evidence shows that men are more vulnerable in the womb and through their lives. Of every 240 males, 240 males are conceived for every 100 females. Yet the ratio of actual birth is 1.05 boys to one girl. Men live much for a more fragile existence throughout their lives and on average die six to seven years earlier. And then some examples of the female specific mountain spirits in. Yes. It seems that women may be less susceptible, susceptible to hate than men. It was predicted that progesterone in women could benefit acclimatization. It acts as a respiratory stimulant, but the clinical benefit regarding the development of AMS was unproven at a high altitude. Despite having said that, uh, there's no proof, oh no, let's say that. Although don't, not, uh, thought otherwise, there's no proven advantage or disadvantage for altitude acclimatization when using combined hormone contraception. Having said that, I found a contradicting study done by Harrison in 2006 and 7 and published in 2013 in Aviation Space and mm -hmm. Medicine, suggesting that combined hormonal contraception at altitude on the sea also associated with the increased rate of AMS development. And the thromboembolism risk, although thought otherwise, there's no proven advantage or disadvantage for the risk of thromboembolism in women using combined hormonal contraception. In 1999, a survey of 316 women on the average base camp track found that 30% were taking combined hormonal contraception many for period control, and none came to any harm, but the data is limited. To put everything in perspective, it should be realized that smokers have a six-fold increased risk for thrombosis. The use of combined hormonal contraception has a four-fold increased risk. Smokers who also use combined hormonal contraception have a 21-fold increased risk for thrombosis. Uh, it is especially those women who have a form of thrombophilia who have the greater risk of thrombosis with a 20 to 35 fold increased risk for those positive for factor 5 Leiden, which is the most common mutation in the population. It might be possible that this last group is responsible for the considerable part of the increased risk for thrombo risk, uh, thrombosis in combined hormonal contraception. 
and in combination with the polycythemia, dehydration, and cold during long stays at high altitude may theoretically be expected to increase the risk of thrombosis in those already at risk. Uh, well, I'm glad we are going to hear much more about these themes from the next speakers in the, at this symposium. As a new group of uh, young enthusiasts will continue the work on this subject. I'm looking forward to hear more from them uh, at this symposium and in the future. Thank you, Helen, for this nice overview and bringing us right into the topic. I think we will proceed due to the time. And I'm very happy to introduce to you Susmita Makai. She's our next speaker. And uh, she's not only the first Nepalese woman who summited uh, the seven summits in 2014, she's probably also one of the best dressed women in the room. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> and we are very keen to hear her view on mountains and women. And probably we have also a direct line to Michelle, I think. So thank you for being here, Susmita. The floor so is yours. <laughs> Thanks so much, Lana. Thanks so much for this opportunity. I, I haven't uh, given talk to a live um, audience uh, since quite a long, <laughs> since Corona and all. So I'm a little nervous today. <laughs> um, okay. So um, some topic of my presentation today, oh, I can't see. No, okay. Women going to altitude, a bizarre way for emancipation. That is my perspective uh, as, a, as a Nepali Nepali woman. Uh, and um, not uh, coming from like uh, unconventional uh, mountaineering, uh, un, 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 as an unconventional mountaineer, you know, I don't come from a mountaineering community. That means I, I don't come from a Sherpa community in Nepal. I come from a an ethnical community called uh, Nevar, who are based in Kathmandu Valley. So we are more known for festival, feast, and <laughs> culture, <laughs> like yeah, dressing up, and yeah. Uh, but we are not not known for mountaineering. And uh, when I started in two thousand and three, there were only uh, four Nepali women who had climbed Mount Everest, and all coming from Sherpa community. So. Uh, I'm the first Nepali woman to climb seven summit, and I led an uh, led an expedition of ten Nepali women to Everest, and we all ten met to the top. Okay. <laughs> Father. Okay. So, um, so my my climbing journey was not very long. It was only for thirteen years. And within that period, I climbed some 15 mountains and I did seven summits. And for a lot of people, it might sound just, okay, seven summits, not a big deal, because most of the mountain is like even uh, like a cakewalk for uh, most of the climbers, like uh, hardcore climbers. And some of them are even um, uh, accessible for the children, you know. So, but for, for me, like for where I come from, it's a huge thing. And uh, as a woman uh, coming from a uh, lower middle class family in uh, uh, from my community and to travel around the world was uh, even a bigger challenge than climbing these peaks. And uh, as you can see, you know, like it, like it wasn't it wasn't easy. It was for for me like this was like a big thing. Like when I uh, told people that I'm traveling around the world and climbing seven summits, like and so like people ask like how you know how are we arranging money and I, I said like i'm spending my own money and they were like okay you you must be crazy so yeah that's that's the title like, you, when you do something unconventional you are tagged like crazy person so how did i begin um so uh, I'll, I'll start with my family 
um, my mother like uh, gave gave birth to four girls in hope of a son. So that's the value of son in our community, you know, in in our society. And um, I, I grew up with my foster parents and not my biological parents. And um, in 2003, I got an opportunity to be part of Nepal Mountaineering Association's female trekking training. And that's how it started. And in the beginning, like, as you can see, like I'm wearing a little heel right now, but I'm very tiny and uh, I was even tinier earlier. And people looked at me and said, like, you, you're climbing the mountain, like, <laughs> not possible. And some, some used to make fun of me saying like, okay, why do you even uh, bother to walk or climb? We could carry you in our backpack. You, <laughs> you, you, you might fit in our pocket, you know? And um, some, uh, some of my, uh co-trainees they used to say like okay Susmita, you are a pretty girl your job is to stay in the city paint your nails make yourself pretty to entertain the boys like just don't trust your nails up here in the mountain so that's what the uh this these were the like some of the like challenges i faced but at the same time like like okay they were um honest as well and uh being tiny and as i heard earlier they, they didn't manufacture like clothing for tiny women you know for for mount like the boots the clothing okay i i when i heard like okay they didn't even make clothing for women earlier you know mountaining but for me it was a big challenge because on my first climb uh on island peak in 2005 i wore boots like four or five sizes bigger than my feet now imagine like climbing an ice wall vertical ice wall and as you take the step, like you take one step, your foot comes out of the boot and then you put, you know, put it back and then again, climb it again. So it was a huge challenge for me. And I, I had to uh, compromise with very poor quality clothing, huge size, bulky clothing. And I suffered like with, with fever and hypothermia, like quite often because of uh, all these things. And one one reason for all these things, like so, when when I started climbing, like a lot of people go with, uh, like for their uh, adrenaline and for like you know joy and passion and all. But for me, it was like something different. It gave me just um, uh, gave me a new hope, you know. And I'll tell you later what it means. So uh, when I was a child, when I was a kid, um, I was molested for many years. And uh, it, it, it just like, and listening to people telling me like uh, all the time, like women are supposed to behave this way, girls are supposed to behave this way and that way. And, you know, and always, there were always uh, boundaries set and um, less opportunities given. When I was on the mountain, I just felt that freedom. At the same time, it was painful because I was not very, uh, I, I, I'm not a tough woman, you know, I am not tough physically. And I was always fragile as a child. I was fragile as, as an adult. And uh, when I was uh, on the mountain, it was so painful. Like when, Every time I uh, set up for the expedition or, or any, any venture on the mountain, the very first day I would start counting the day I return. Because it's not easy, like carrying big loads, like bigger than your weight and uh, um, matching up with the tapes of people taller than you, stronger than you, you know, and with like poor quality clothing and shoes, it was not easy. But in that pain, I could forget about the pain that was like hunting me for so many years as a, as a child, as, as growing as a person, you know. So it was like more like a spiritual journey than, than the competitive uh, one. Uh, okay. As I started climbing, like I started to become very famous um, because I was one of a kind uh, in Nepali mountaineering. And in 2005, I attempted to climb Mount Everest for the first time after I had done uh, some peaks and I was like all over the news. And this uh, is something like is good for some people, but for somebody like me, it is just too much. It's just too much pressure for, for someone, you know, 
when you everybody's expecting that you reach the top and you are on all the news. So in 2005, I was 40 meters below the summit when I had when I was like forcefully stopped and made to turn back because I came from a different community. And because that same day, a girl from my community was trying to be the first one to climb Everest, and she was um, marrying a Sherpa. <laughs> so I, I, was, I was physically stopped, and I didn't understand what was happening. So I was crying, I was pleading, my guide and I was telling like okay I'll pay you more when I go back because so many people are expecting my climb you know my family is is um expecting the news like the media the sponsors I have to you know like raise more money to like pay my debt but he wouldn't let me go and he was just like holding me with my harness and there was a point like after 40 45 minutes I said like, okay I I just turned around and that was a very painful uh, descent for me because I was crying all the way down and I was hoping that I die accidentally so that I don't have to answer anybody why I failed. But at the same time, I was thinking about my mother and I was saying like, okay, I need to go back to my mother, you know? So there were like, like con conflicts and I was like, okay, climb. I was not walking down. I was just sliding down, like just sliding down all the way to camp floor. I don't know how many times I fell, you know. I just like had to get down there or kill myself and, you know, not be answerable to anyone. Okay. So in 2007, I we, along with my uh, two Sherpa leaders, uh, organized an expedition bringing 10 women from all different ethical backgrounds together. And we tried to climb Everest. When people look at me, like, I, I look very tiny. I'm very tiny. Actually, I don't look like tiny, but I'm tiny. But this is me. I'm one of the tallest one in the team. <laughs> now, like, <laughs> So I uh, like out of 10, eight were novice climbers and uh, myself and one more uh, girl, Usha, we were experienced and we both had failed on our, on our first Everest expedition. So when we went for uh, sponsors, you know, when we went to sponsors, they looked at us like, okay, you 10 tiny crazy girls, you're going to kill yourself on the mountain. And people were really skeptic and it was very obvious as well because it was not very usual that like, so many women, women from all different backgrounds, like, you know, all different sizes who don't look like uh, conventional mountain. Yeah. <laughs> They're trying to do something which is like a big feat. And even our, our, our Sherpa friends, they used to make fun of us and say like, it's good, you girls are tiny. If you die up here, it will be easy for us to carry you down. Oh, so uh, that was the attitude. But uh, in May, 2008, we all ten made it to the top of Everest, becoming the most successful women Everest expeditions ever. So, yeah. Great. Well, but like, you know, like people uh, tend to like stick together in problem and in challenges, but when there is success, there are more conflicts. And yeah, I had to part way with my team of 10. And then, yeah, we did, uh, we, ventured our seven summits journey like separate okay and when i say growth like uh obviously because i was going back to mountain so frequently like bit by bit i was getting really strong i i was like climbing like on everest like faster than most of the people uh in 2011 when i climbed uh, everest for the third time I went from base camp direct to um, camp two. I did it acclimatize and uh, I, I acclimatized at the base camp. So from camp two, I went straight to the summit and I went back to camp two without mm -hmm. sleeping in camp three or camp four. So that was my stamina. And uh, every time they checked uh, oxygen, I was always above 90. It was so crazy that in Argentina, 
in the camp, like in Atangkakua, when they check, because you have to check, you know, they, they don't allow you until you are fit. They checked, the oxygen level came like 100, 100, 100. Like, and then on third uh, attempt, it came like, they were like, this can't be true. And then it came 99, you're like, okay, I just, this is the record, I have 99 on your record. So I was getting really stronger as um, physically, also mentally, psychologically. And I think like, Personally, it, it was more like, you know, like the like personal growth was more than the, the physical strength and stamina. So as I said, like like in 2011, mm, I was climbing Everest for the third time. This was the weather. It was really bad, super windy, super cold, um, but you have to do it, you know? There is a problem, like if you don't make to the summit, you haven't climbed the mountain, that's the attitude, you know, that's how you are received by most of the people, your success counts. And before this uh, Everest expedition, I was on Amadablam. Uh, it was um, January of 2011. Uh, we were uh, heading to the summit really, really late from the last camp. And we arrived at 4 p.m. in the afternoon on the summit, super windy day. And as we came down, two of our climbers, like Nepali climbers, they got sick. and. Some of our friends were helping one guy get down and some were behind helping another girl. And uh, two of my very good Sherpa friends, friends said, like, Susmita, you're strong enough. We think you can come down by yourself. And I said, OK, I'll do it. It was really dark, pitch dark, super windy. And the wind was so strong and me being so thin, like it felt like somebody is hitting me from all over, you know, like with, with a big piece of wood. And I started like getting hypothermic. I couldn't move my fingers, my toes, like I, my lips, I could see it was turning blue. I was holding the rope, rope, facing the ice wall, praying to the God, okay, please stop, please stop. And then I was like losing it. And I said, okay, I was thinking about my family, my friends and remembering, okay, this is the last time I'm gonna be thinking about everybody because tomorrow if, if somebody, you know, finds me, either I'm dead to frostbite and like out of death to frozen and or if they rescue me i would lose i don't know <laughs> my my fingers toes hands and legs you know so i was like crying and praying but then i was like something in my heart said like okay i you, you can't give up and then i started screaming for help and that was one of the most difficult thing to do because never in my life have I ever screamed for help or like, no, like, like literally like help, help. I have never done that. And it was so difficult to do, but then I did it. And my two friends, they turned around and they were, I could see the lights, you know, and we were in this wall and I could see them, two lights coming, like climbing back. And it just gave me hope. I just cleared my rope. I climbed down as fast as possible on the way down because of the wind, I was blown and banged on the rock. I, I uh, injured both my knees, with injured knees, I came down to base camp. Then we had to climb further down to Surke, which is below Lukla because of bad weather. And then we were, after a week, we were rescued by a helicopter. Bedridden for a month and a half, recovered, and I was back on Everest for the third time. So, uh, a lot of people think like, oh, I have climbed mountain and now I'm like an iron man, iron woman, you know, <laughs> they have this attitude. But for me, I think like every time I go to the mountain, I'm equally nervous. I'm really worried and I'm really scared, you know, every time I go there because I don't know what what happens, you know, I I, I don't like um, I go to the mountain and nature because I love it, not because I want to challenge it. Because I know, like, you know, it could be really, really brutal if nature wants to challenge you. And uh, that's why I, every time I go, I surrender myself to the success, to the failure, to everything. So one thing I believe what I have achieved so far in these many years with mountaineering is voice. Because I, I couldn't talk about, like, things earlier and as i started climbing and started like you know sharing my story i started i think I, I started getting the voice and i could like talk to people i could you know reflect 
uh, reflect and um, uh, how do you say um, bring light to things which I wanted to you know uh, tell people and it, it it really helped the confidence really helped um, no matter like success or failure it just kept uh, helping me like build my voice. And I think mountain is my biggest motivation. It just helps me like keep going. Uh, though right now I am not climbing anymore because I have two younger children, and I always knew that like once I have my priority changed, I will stop climbing. And but still, like a mountain is my biggest motivation. And coming here was like just coming back to mountain and felt awesome. So, uh, as I said earlier, being um, being a victim, being a survivor of um, um, childhood sexual abuse um, and sexual abuse, um, I, I like to do a lot of awareness uh, programs. So I do a lot of talks in schools all over the world, and it is all voluntary. And I, wherever I travel, even in Nepal, I have traveled to a lot of schools and given talk about my mountain and also about creating awareness about like uh, the rights of children and what is right and wrong you know when it comes to the abuses and all and this is something i want to um, make my motto for um, rest of my life and that's it like we all have our, our own mountain to climb and i believe you all have climbed your own mountain so for, for, for me, you all are the um, summitiers and congratulations. Thank you so much, Niti. Yeah, Susmita, it was really an impressive talk. Do you have questions to Susmita? We still have time, so. So, Smita, what's what are your future projects? You just oh, okay. very shall I? Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, I don't know if we could do with the YouTube, but it's okay. Um, I, I I'm here uh, uh, today evening, so I can uh, share the um, project uh, personally or uh, uh, like as well. So my my dream is to um create an um awareness so i'm 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 working on uh creating uh animation series for the children mm -hmm. so that they uh, get to know about all these things they get the um awareness thing through the animation like every week you know and we want to present it through the um some of the uh people who are inspiring like inspiring women mountaineer or athlete in Nepal so there will be like people and they will be uh, with, with, with each episode they will be able to learn about their rights and uh, how to prevent and how to you know go ahead with all these kind of uh, abuses so this is something I'm working on and this is I think it's very ambitious project and I <laughs> clapped from the scratch but I'm working on it, and I, I think I'm going. It's going to be huge if it uh, works, and I want to uh, make it more global because this is uh, not an issue for one person or one community or one country. It's something like people, uh, children, like all over the world are facing, and I think uh, we could do something, um, you yeah, know, in coming days. But I'm, I'm really working on it, so I, I don't have like exact. Uh, material right now but if we uh, yeah get connected then i can share you the uh, thoughts very personally personal thank you thank you so yeah you see that there's not only much mountaineering experience here that is also very much power here you, you heard from monica from really inspiring woman i think that's that's almost the most beautiful of today to see all this power within this room or group. Yeah, well, the next speaker is also very impressive. Billy Zierling, 
Yeah, she is impressive. Yeah, <laughs> she's the was the first German woman on Mount Everest. No, no, no that's no, not no, true. No, no, no. Okay, the third. the third. Yeah, but yes. still an excellent <laughs> climber, an exceptional athlete, and she's also uh, stepped in big steps from Elizabeth Foley, and she now le leads or works for the Himalayan Data Bank, which is grown a lot. And yeah, we. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Thank you very much for having me here. Even though it's a medical conference, I don't have much medical things to say. But um, as Jacqueline just said, I've been sort of in the mountaineering business for the last 18 years. So I've seen a lot. I mean, I always asked me about two or three months ago. I said, oh, Billy, can you do a presentation? But I need a title now. But, OK. Um, and I just came up with a title. So, you know, that gave me a lot of scope to just talk about anything. But when I did put the title, it's high time for women, I actually, now how does this work? Uh, I actually, yeah. exactly. So I thought about a woman who I've worked for, Jacqueline just um, mentioned it, who said something about women and pioneers. But before I play you what she said, I want to explain to you who she is. So some of you may have known her or may have met her or have read about her. It's Miss Elizabeth Hawley. There she was young with her parents. She was born in the 1920s. She went on a trip around the world in the late 1950s, which was um, pretty impressive, pretty courageous. And she came through Nepal in the late 50s and she thought, wow, you know, that's really interesting. Nepal is opening its, uh, its doors to the West. China had invaded Tibet. So she wanted to take part in this process. So she went back to the States and then she became, so she was a journalist before, and then she just found herself a job with Time Life magazine and Reuters to become a female, uh, a freelance journalist. Now, she came back to what well, she went back to Kathmandu in the early 60s. And in 1963, 20, no, not 20, exactly 10 years after Tenzing and Hillary climbed Everest, the first big American Everest expedition came to Nepal. And Ms. Hawley was one of the only, uh, you know, American journalists. There was Barbara Adams as well, but she was not so much in the scene. So Ms. Hawley wrote about this expedition and she had scoops on all the big newspapers in the states and all over the world about this amazing expedition because they climbed from the south and the north and they met in top and then miss hawley thought well that was rather interesting but the thing is she wasn't really interested in the mountains and miss hawley never climbed <laughs> she never even went to every space camp she never wore a pair of crampons but I, you know, I worked for her for 18 years, but I think it was the people she was interested in. She just thought, why are these people are so crazy? They go and climb these big mountains. Um, and then she exactly, she basically made her hobby an institution or it, it became an institution. So after this 1963 Everest expedition, the next Everest expedition came and the next, I mean, there is, you know, every two years there was one. And then she started uh, covering other peaks. Makalu, she wanted to talk to all the mountaineers. And back in the days, Miss Hawley would take her Beatles, drive to the airport. There were like three international mountain uh, flights a week. And she would look, you know, who's wearing mountaineering boots? Are we come here? Where are you going? And so she would get their details before they go to the mountain. And then when they come back. So obviously, for me, it was almost more always more interesting, you know, when they come back, because then we would find out that they summit, that they're not summit with oxygen, without oxygen, with Sherpa, and so on and so forth. And I once said to her, Miss Woolley, why do we have to meet them before? And then she said, Well, if they don't come back, you don't have that date of birth. <laughs> so Anyway, here you see Miss Elizabeth Hawley with uh, Willie Steck after his uh, Annapurna South. Um, expedition in 2013 um, she did work until she was 92 years old so in 2016 she handed the scepter over to me and she was 92 then as I said and then she sadly passed away in 2018. 
now can we have the next one out of you um so yeah so i've already talked about myself why am i here i started working with her in 2004 up until then miss hawley had put all her notes on paper and there were 10 no not 10 there were three nepali ladies who typed all miss hawley's papers into you know they digitalized them took them almost 10 years and it was published in 2004 and that was also the year i started working for her and i thought oh i just want to hang out in Kathmandu and meet some climbers and you know and um thought i'll do it for a year or two and little did i know that in 2016 she said well now i'm done now you can carry on but what she does so, so it was a little bit of a roundabout way um and now i want to actually get to the topic um yes so i carry this so miss elizabeth Hallina, do we have sound this is loud enough you may so she said something to me when Urs asked me for my title and what i should talk about i just remembered her and i found an interview i did with her and i found you may find it difficult to hear Fine. Right, you may have found it difficult to hear, but Miss Hawley always used to say women. Of course, she's seen many women come to Nepal and start doing big peaks, but she always said they are playing copycats. They follow men. Where are the women mountaineers? And she felt very, very strongly about it. And um, I've pressed this one. And of course, you know, we had, I mean, I'm, I'm much more uh, aware of what's been happening in the Himalaya. Of course, we had women like Lucy Wilson, who six years after Wimper climbed the Matterhorn. Um, she did some climbs before. The Matterhorn seemed unclined until Wimper did it, and um, a day later, the Italian, uh, six years later, um, Lucy, no, I would say Wilson, um, Walker came up. Um, but again, she, amazing achievement, but she followed into men's footstep. Um, the very first female expedition to Nepal was actually quite interesting because it was in 1955. And the, woman, the women who went, there were three Scottish women, and they weren't even intending to have a female expedition. They just wanted to climb a mountain. And it was a mountain called Lenopo Ri. It's 6,500. And these three Scottish women got together. They climbed the mountain, but they had three Sherpas with them, three male Sherpas. And it was really nice because 50 years later, in 2005, one of them came back to track trek to base camp so i met her her name was evelyn and now i have another piece of audio because i asked her you know how did you in 1955 you know where it was so hard for women to get out and do these things um how did you manage to get this women's expedition together and this is what she said so they and it was really nice because as i said they had three sherpas with them one of them was mingba galton who was very strong and they named the mountain the first ascent of the mountain with the Sherpas, and they named the mountain Galgen Peak. Now, for me, from the Himalayan database, when I look at women's expedition, they come and they say, oh, we are a women's expedition. But sometimes there are four women and eight male Sherpas. So I think, well, is it really a women's expedition? Of course, you know, the women, they get together and they do it. And, you know, I don't want to put it down at all. I think it's impressive. Um, and I think you said before, you know, we don't, we still don't see women climbing together very often. And I think it's wonderful. But we also have, and um, Susmita, you probably, or you probably all know her, Dawa Yangzum, who is the only female Nepali 
mountain guide. So she's the IF, she's an IFMGA mountain guide in Nepal. So there are Shapanis, that there are really strong, good women who could actually also say, right, why don't we do a female expedition with Shapanis? Um, Dawa Yangzen has an amazing um, CV. She's an amazing climber. Um, now there are 70 Sherpas in Nepal who are IFMGA mountain guides. I think the first one was in 2008. Dawa Yangzen was the only female one. Um, I asked her whether there's somebody following into her footsteps and so far she doesn't um, think that there, there are, but hopefully we will have more um, women or Shapani mountain guides. Now, just uh, very quickly, um, so the Himalayan database um, is now digital. You know, if you're interested, you can find out anything and anything under the planet. You know, Miss Hawley did a very good job. We still try to do a good job, but it's getting harder and harder. And I'll talk about it in a minute. But for example, so I did just out of interest, I did a search. So here I did a search male success, solo and no oxygen. So I got the count of 75. Um, that means um, you know, solo men doing a, a mountain in Nepal. For women, solo are only found two. But that's not to say there are, for example, first ascents. There are 61 women who were part of an expedition as a first ascent. Um, but that's just, I, I singled that out. And then I did, um, you know, I was actually quite surprised. I did a search male success solo no oxygen and first ascent and i was actually surprised i mean i don't know the database is not always completely right to only find four men and no members found during the search for for women but that's not to say there are and there have been amazing women out there and uh, miss holy always thought very highly of wonder now i have to get the name right she was a polish climber um, she was the she did the second ascent and obviously the first uh, female ascent of the um, Mesna Hubler Ridge on the Eiger, the first ascent of Gashibum three. And I thought it was interesting because she was the leader of the expedition as a woman that was very rare back in the days. And then she was in 78, the third woman um, to summit Everest, the first woman together with two of her compatriots on K2. And in 1992, she sadly disappeared on Kantinjunga and Again, that's something I didn't know, that Wanda, back in 1992, that's 30 years ago, strived to do eight 8,000 meter peaks in a year. And so when I first started working for Miss, Miss Elizabeth Hawley in 2004, there were few climbers who strive to do all 14, 8,000 meter peaks. I mean, I think you uh, talked before about uh, Basang Lamu, she's doing it. Uh, now, I mean, it's it's um, young men and young, as I say, in 2004, maybe 15 people who were trying to do all 14, and they were all alpinists. There were, you know, there's Galinda and Ralf, and you have um, Hiro from Japan, here are the crazy Spaniards, and um, Carlos Soria, actually, he's 83, he is still doing it. He was on Daulagiri for the 15th time. Daulagiri is the um, seventh highest mountain in the world. For the 15th time this year, he only needs Daulagiri and he is still on his quest. Are oh, you looking already at the watch it was? Um, okay. Now, what happened in 2019, now I'm back to men. Um, Nimstai, Nirma Bhutta, you may have heard of him. He's got an amazing film called The 14 Peaks. He set out in 2019, he said, I'm going to climb all 14, 8,000 meter peaks in seven months. And we, you know, we're on the scene and we just said, yeah, right. It's never going to happen. He did it. He did it in six months and six days. Of course, he did it in a very different style from in the mountain years I've just um, showed you. He's had a very, very big team of shepherds, helicopters to the mountains back and forth. Um, you cannot, I always say, you know, to compare a climb like this to what example um, Gelinde Kaltenbrunner did is like comparing apple and oranges, but he did it. And what I find incredibly interesting, so that was in 2019, then 2020, of course, didn't happen because there was COVID. 2021, I was actually quite surprised how busy it was on, um, on Everest. 
And, and now, after Nims die, that this feed in 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 six months or six days, you have a lot of young women who are trying to do the same. So this is, for example, Ad Adriana Brownlee. She's twenty one. She has climbed ten eight thousand meter peaks in the last. I mean, there I don't quite know in the last two years. And um, she now wants to be um, the youngest woman to to do all fourteen. And um, and well, she won't be the fastest because here you have Christine Harila, who's a Norwegian lady. She is a little bit older. She's in her mid thirties. And she, again, she set out to do what Nimstai said. And there I hear Miss Hawley, I see, you know, they're copycats. So I, I spoke to her in length and I, t I do take my hat off. She flies, of course, she flies to the base camps. She has oxygen, she has shepherds. But she does it. I mean, I've climbed also high mountains. I come back and I need a break for at least two months. Uh, but they come, they go up and down and they get into the helicopter, go to the next mountain. Um, but it's not really alpinism anymore. You know, it's athletic. And I don't, again, I don't uh, judge it. Um, so she is actually now on her way to beat nymphs. And Nim said to me, I spoke to him and I said, what do you think about Kristen Harila doing this? And he was actually quite kind. And he said, oh, I think it's great. And we all know women are stronger in the mountains than men. And um, then, of, of course, he said, oh, but she won't be rescuing all these people, uh, you know, all the people I rescued. And <laughs> um, I do think that most of the people Nim's rescued, though he is very strong, um, were rescued by his shepherds. Um, but I thought it was interesting. She's really a lovely, lovely woman. And I asked her why she was doing it and why she wasn't doing anything new. And then she said, and I didn't quite agree with it. She said, well, women haven't really done anything amazing in the Himalaya. And there I just said, well, oh no, here we are. Um, you know, I mean, there was... you know comes to my mind is Galinda who of course and I thought without shepherds without supplemental oxygen but it took her 13 years three months and 17 days so what's been happening now in the Himalaya and as I say it's interesting that we have a lot of young women so Kristen and Adriana Brownlee they were just examples there are I you know I could talk to you about five six seven uh, young women who do it um, and it's become a, a huge competition, a race. Um, and for me, for the Himalayan database, it's becoming really, really difficult. Because back in the days, Miss Hawley would go to the airport and check the mountaineers. And now we just don't know who is where. And, and, and I mean, we'll try we'll, um, and we'll hope that uh, more and more women will um, will come to, to Nepal. And also, I mean, if you look at Everest, for example, um, around six and a half thousand different people have climbed Mount Everest, six, 670 women. So we are about over, you know, more than 10%. Um, so women are doing more, but maybe, you know, I keep on hearing Miss Hawley. I mean, I'm not good enough or strong enough to do pioneering in the Himalaya, but anybody of you is, do come. And then I, um, I just found during my, my research, I just found this, um, Wrote by uh, Mummery saying all mountains appear doomed to pass through the three stages an inaccessible peak, the hardest climb in the Alps, or an easy day for a lady. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that was my short overview of the uh, Himalaya, not to do anything with mountain medicine, but I hope you enjoyed it. And um, yeah, but as I say, I think women are doing great in the Himalaya needs a little bit more of power. Pioneering would make the late Miss Elizabeth Hawley very happy. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, maybe I, I misunderstood it, but it's, it's a question for you and for your um, your older presenter. What was her idea, her goal of collecting the data? Well, she, as I so she came to Nepal, she covered the 1963 Everest expedition, and then she was so interested in the people. And then she 
met the next expedition and the next and the next. And when I asked her, why did you actually carry on doing it? And um, she just said, well, I started something and I finished it and now you can finish it. And what the most funny thing was for me, I asked her, I said, but Miss Holly, how does it feel to give up something you have been so passionate about? And she looked at me, passionate? How can you possibly be passionate about a database? I didn't. I started and I finished it. So she did it, and it was interesting. The last two years of her life, um, she was no longer doing interviews, and I would go and see her. And I just thought, oh, I involve her a little bit. I tell her about the latest expeditions. She wasn't interested. She was, you know, she did it when she did it, and that was it. But yeah, and now we have the Himalayan database. So it was like a process of, oh, I get this information and this, and then it was all digitalized. And now we have to see how we carry on. But um, yeah, 70 years next year, it'll be 70 years after the first ascent of Everest. Maybe we need to make changes. And my engineers contact you and you look I wish, that. I wish. <laughs> yeah, or is, for example, I saw him on after that, Madame, who, who I contacted you, didn't I? <laughs> Probably. And um, most people, but the thing is, we and also Miss Hawley, Hawley, we spoiled them. It was a tradition. You would arrive in Kathmandu, and Maria, you know, you've been there, or, you know, and Miss Hawley would ring your hotel about five minutes after you arrived in the hotel. Yes. Yeah. People always said, How does she know that I just walked in? What people didn't know is that she'd been ringing for an hour already every five minutes. I mean, she walk in, she, she was obsessed. So um, now we digitalize more. I try and, and you know, tell people, get in touch with me. Um, we work with trekking agents. We get our information from the Ministry of Tourism, but it's hard. But I do want to carry on. But I think we have to make some changes, especially what's been happening on the 8,000 meter peaks. And one last question. Yes, sorry. Um, I'm thinking you have a double Dealing with these uh, athletes going for like records one after the other, mm. but you were saying yourself that after you doing a big peak, you need some recovery time months. Yeah. yeah. Does it also mean that you somehow see why it's so hard for them, or do you know why it's so hard? Why do you need two months of recovery? Well, I well I look at them and it's not so hard for them. I speak to young women and they. they Oh yeah, I climbed Everest and then I did lots of the next day and now I'm down and I go to Makalu and I just, just leave. I really don't know whether the younger, I mean, they take more oxygen now. I mean, I climbed Everest with supplemental oxygen. I mean, so did Susmita. Hey, climbing Everest without oxygen is only really for very, very few people. Still, it's hard, but I do think maybe they use more oxygen. So a flow rate of seven or eight liters there now, but of course then they have more Sherpas. Um, yeah, it's it's, but it's I I still take my hat off. It's still hard, still hard. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will now make a break. I think there's outside coffee and things to eat. And we will restart uh, 15 minutes half three.
Well, after that incredible start to our afternoon, I am um, pleased to kick off the, after the next section. I want you to know that there's going to be another break after about three talks. So um, if you need to, just so you know what to expect. And there, there will be more caffeine available. <laughs> and let us say something about yourself. Because yeah, nobody yeah. knows. <laughs> <laughs> we know. Yeah, that's right. I'm Linda Keys. I was very graciously invited here by Dr. Hefty. Thank you very much. I'm the past president of the Wilderness Medical Society, and I have been leading the group of women who have taken the initial work that Dr. Jean and Dr. Meyer and Dr. Leal did with the first women going to altitude paper, and we have. Um, moved the, that project forward by trying to make a more evidence-based review. So what you're going to hear for the rest of the afternoon is really more of the medical topics and that based on a literature review and then many reviews that we're putting together that we hope will be published in um, high, altitude, uh, high Altitude Medicine and Biology sometime in the next few months. So without further ado, I would like to introduce my Colorado colleague, Dr. Mia Durstein, who is the uh, one of my colleagues at the University of Colorado and the Associate Fellowship Director of the Wilderness Medicine Fellowship at University of Colorado. And she's going to tell us all about acute mound sickness and high altitude cerebral edema in women. Thank you, Linda, for that introduction. Again, I'm Mia Durstein. I'm an emergency medicine physician in Colorado. And this talk is about AMS and haste in women and what we actually need to know based on the literature. And if I'm speaking too quickly in my American accent, just wave a hand and slow me down. Uh, this is a photo taken. I took this photo of Summit Camp in Greenland. It's the interior of Greenland where I got to serve as a medic for six weeks. And this is located at about 10 and a half to 11,000 feet of elevation or about 3,000 meters. So surprisingly, Greenland has elevation as well. <laughs> so our objectives today are to just review acute mountain sickness and high altitude cerebral edema, to talk about some sex hormone differences, and then really the most of the time will be spent on talking about literature and what the most recent review has been. And this is a photo of Junko Tabe. Uh, a Japanese woman who was the first woman recognized to summit Everest. So let's just go over some basic terminology to start with. So when we talk about high altitude medicine, we can separate it into three categories. If you look at different books or journals, sometimes these numbers will be a little bit different, but more or less high altitude is 1500 meters, very high is 3500, and extreme is 5500 meters. So all of the 8000 meter peaks, of course, are in this category. Oops, excuse me. And to put this into context, where I live in Denver is actually considered high altitude already. Where we are here in Diaboleza is still in the high altitude category. There's very few cities that are in the very high category, and there's no cities where people live permanently in the extreme category. So let's just start with some definitions, starting with high altitude headache, which would be the most mild form of an altitude sickness. It typically starts above 2,400 meters, although sometimes you will see people that can be affected at lower elevations. It's typically within the first 24 hours of ascent. The headache can be either frontal or bilateral, typically. It can be worse with exertion, bending, coughing, any movements that would exacerbate a headache. And it typically responds to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen. Moving up a step, what we talk more frequently about is acute mountain sickness or AMS. And I'll use this emoji a few times so you can just pay attention to that one. Again, it's typically above 2,400 meters. So we are at that elevation currently. It typically will start a little bit sooner. And it's most often recognized as being a headache and another symptom. So difficulty eating, nausea, weakness, dizziness, like we saw in the little cute video earlier. 
And these things together make up the Lake Louise criteria, which is a research criteria for acute mountain sickness. Some things that can affect this are acclimatization. So are you from altitude? Did you spend time at altitude before going up? How quickly you are ascending? And then whether or not you've had AMS previously. And we'll go more into this. Going a step further in severity, we can talk about high altitude cerebral edema or HACE. This typically happens a little bit higher in elevation, 3,000 meters or above. And it's really characterized by encephalopathy. So you need to have some neurological findings other than just the headache, which is subjective. So an example of this could be ataxia. And this is taken from a, um, a YouTube series about mountain medicine. Um, and importantly, you should not have a focal neurological deficit, meaning if someone on the mountain suddenly has facial droop and can't move their right arm, that's probably a stroke and probably not HACE. HACE is more global. There are some caveats. Uh, cranial nerve three and cranial six deficiencies could imply HACE with impending herniation of the brain. HACE is frequently associated with high altitude pulmonary edema or HAPE, but they don't have to go hand in hand. You can have them independently of each other. So again, just to review, uh, altitude sickness, we start with high altitude headache and the most mild. If you add on these additional symptoms of fatigue, nausea, anorexia, and poor sleep, now you qualify as acute mountain sickness. And then if you add on neurological findings like ataxia or encephalopathy, like confusion, people will have word salad. Now we're talking about haste. So we're at a women going to altitude conference. So now let's start to talk about some of the differences. So we know that sex hormones can affect performance at altitude. They've done some studies that look at estrogen and it looks like it can increase cerebral blood flow, which should be protective. Progesterone is a respiratory stimulant, which again should be protective. But then on the flip side, testosterone has increased erythropoiesis. Pretend there's an R here, sorry about that. Um, and VO2 max. All of these sex hormones, you would think, theoretically, should lead to some benefits. Well, but we know that's not necessarily true in real life. The data in real life is a little bit limited. I was only able to find some studies on this. Um, one study, for example, looked at pre-treating a group of um, men and women with medroxyprogesterone, but it didn't reduce AMS. Um, there was a brief mention of the Harrison study in Antarctica earlier about women. It was a women-only cohort using uh, oral contraceptive pills or birth control pills. And it looked like the group that was using oral contraception had slightly increased rates of AMS, but it was only 50 women. So the total numbers are pretty small for this study. There was another study that looked at whether or not menstrual cycle affected AMS, and they had they found that it did not, depending on which portion of your menstrual cycle you were on, it didn't affect the rates of AMS. And then there was another study just looking at men. They took men's blood samples at altitude, and the men with a higher testosterone ratio actually had more AMS, meaning it maybe wasn't protective. But this data is all over the place. You can't really make a clear consensus from these studies. It's kind of everywhere. So the big question, are women at increased risk of acute mountain sickness or haste? No, no, mm -hmm. let's go into the data for it a little bit. So the writing group that Dr. Keyes was mentioning um, has pulled together hundreds of studies um, to look at whether or not there was a difference and then after we looked at these hundreds of studies, we narrowed it down to the ones that actually published data on men versus women. And this is self-reported women. So I want to say that for trans women, um, this data may not be reflective, but we ultimately included 38 studies. Two of them were with women only cohorts. You can see that there was still far more men included in the studies, almost 11,000 compared to only 6,000 or so women and only four of them were on high altitude cerebral edema. So it's very, very little information, and only five were pediatric. 
these were several of the journals that were um, included most frequently, the Wilderness and Environmental Medicine Journal, HANV, and Aviation Space and Environmental Medicine. So looking at the studies that specifically dealt with AMS, there was about 38 of them. And these, this bar graph is how many studies showed that either women, men, or neither sex were at increased risk. This is not the total number of people, just the number of studies. So 12 of the studies found that there was women were at increased risk. Three of the studies said that men were at increased risk. And 21 of the studies said neither. I will say that one of the studies that said that women were at increased risk was a very large meta-analysis that included, I think, 4,000 participants, but they excluded every paper that had a null finding. And so take it with a little grain of salt, obviously. When we talk about pediatrics, the same kind of holds true. So there was a study that found girls were at increased risk, a study found that boys increased risk, and then three that found that there was no difference. This is for 18 years of age and under. And then again, for high altitude cerebral edema, there was only four total papers that I could find about the topic. So one showed women at increased risk, one showed neither. And then these two, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about it. So one of the studies looked at the rates of what they called severe high altitude illness, SHAI, and it combined AMS, HACE, HAPE, I believe maybe high altitude headache as well. And it was a large cohort study. They just watched these people go up to uh, altitude and come back down and looked at the reports. In the group of women that were not taking acetazolamide, sorry, it got cut off there. Um, the women who are not taking acetazolamide did have increased risk of HACE, but the women who were taking acetazolamide had the exact same rates as men. That same data set was then used again for another publication a couple years later, exactly the same data set. And they did some statistical modeling and then found that actually there was no difference at all, regardless of acetazolamide use. So you can see where we're going with this. Basically, all of the studies, there's really not a single one that concludes definitively that women are at increased risk of either AMS or HACE. This is a forest plot of some of the data. For all of the studies, out of the 38, there were only these that actually included their um, confidence intervals and the actual odds ratios. Um, the black ones are the ones that are statistically significant, and the gray ones are the ones that were not statistically significant. But this just gives you an idea of what the data actually looked like. So while it tended to, this is the line one. So an odds ratio of one means that men and women have exactly the same amount. Um, towards this side means that women have more, towards this side mean that men had more AMS. The data looks as if it wants to trend towards the women, but when you crunch all the numbers, it doesn't. There was a couple outliers. So what are the recommendations then for women going to altitude? Well, I would say that based on this most current literature review on the data that we have, that there's no apparent increased risk of AMS for women of any age. There's no apparent menstrual cycle effect, and we need more data on uh, birth control use, but there will be a whole talk about that later on. There's limited data on HACE, and I think that we need more than just those four studies. So what is the prevention and treatment? This is really why we're all here. We're going into the mountains and we want to know what do we do for ourselves? So it's not gender specific at this point. The recommendations for women will be the same as they are for men. You want to limit your ascent by 300 to 500 meters per day, anytime you're going above 3000 meters. And again, like the little video showed, you wanna take a rest day every few days, unless you're a superhuman that's acclimatized and can do it faster. Um, and then the treatment of severe AMS or HACE includes rapid descent as the primary mode, but then you can also use these adjuncts as well. A portable hypobaric chamber like a gamma bag, acetazolamide, and the dosing is still, the perfect dosing is still being worked on, and then dexamethasone, although there's some controversy with this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
So if anyone has any questions, yeah. Um, all data, all, all studies you showed were all studies who only used like what the patients or the study object reported. Like there's no objective way to to know if they had. I mean, if I go up and have a headache, and if they come down and ask me how do you feel, and say not so good, I have a headache. Yeah. Do I have AMS or do I have nothing? Exactly. And so all of this data, uh, at least for AMS and for high altitude headaches, is based on subjective reporting and self-reported scores. Um, in the paper that we're writing, we, we go into it a little bit further because I think probably this is my assumption and I don't have the data to back it up. There are probably some differences between men and women and how we self-report. Um, and so I think that probably affects it somewhat. But yes, this is all self-reported data because we don't have a good way for a researcher standing on a um, 4,000 meter peak of objectively measuring it That's other than nice. surveys. But some of those studies were contemporary and contemporaneous. So some of them were people coming home and saying, did I have symptoms? But most of them were people in the moment filling out a questionnaire about symptoms. Yes. So it wasn't, they didn't have to remember if they had symptoms. No. It was yeah. in the moment. I think there was only two of the studies were from like a French travel clinic. So when they came back to France, they reported it. But yes, the vast majority of the studies included were a researcher standing on a mountainside with it's the surveys. Only if you take the questionnaire on the mountain versus at home. It's also a difference. Of course, yeah. Yes. In the, in the French studies, they have to feel uh, on, on, uh, on site. They have to feel it mm. and they report when they come back to France. That's smarter, so, yeah. So. Yeah. Did the studies um, ask about the ascent profile? Um, or is it just strictly symptom based? Some of them did. Again, there was 38 included. And as you can tell by the forest plot, where like only some report the data with numbers and the methods were entirely different. And oh boy, there's a lot of variability between these 38 studies. So, yeah. Uh, a lot of these arose from the old studies. Was anyone using the old regulations mm -hmm. or have you made any effort to create it, which would mean going back to the original data? With the uh, newer release form? Um, there are a few that were included in our review that were older studies. Most of the studies that we included have been done in the last 10 to 15 years. Some of them do comment that they're using the revised Lake Louise score. There was one or two that actually said that they did both versions to see if there was any difference. But again, there's so much variability. And so, and because the total number was still only 38 studies, I couldn't further segment it into the newer Lake Louise scores. I would have lost too many studies. Um, would you expect that that alters the results? Because there's no different. <laughs> and so, all the ways, uh, yeah. would you expect that could be. No, no. there would be in my knowledge about the Lake Louise score change. <laughs> Um, and I was part of the group which suggested it did change, and I'm actually, uh, I think, yeah, um, I have reservations about what came out. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, yeah, I, mean, I think that's why they, a lot of people use both in their work because yeah. you're not the only one with those reservations. Maybe the, the big ones is bigger because what we learned in our expedition was that some men they had like zero symptoms, never. They did fill up anything. Mm -hmm. Always good, 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 good. Yes. And maybe women are more honest. <laughs> it makes so more difference between the two exactly. scores, mm -hmm. the newer and the older one, yes. than the type of the type of person who fills out this question. Totally sure. Good point. This was exactly my point. So it's it's very subjective, the whole Louis score. Mm -hmm. So um there are probably gender specific answering of the yeah. questions. And so, and as it is subjective, you will never know whether um, either quality is a problem or whether some people suffer better than others. Yeah. <laughs> I did my thesis about uh, when I had 12 men in my group, and I was so upset because it was like one or two did never have symptoms, and the other were really guiding as men. <laughs> It's upset, so and I mean, the chain comes, it's made, it's different. So, male AMS, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I have to say, we, we 
tested um, in our study that is included in this review. We brought families up to 3,500 meters of altitude and we measured this in all families. And then we additionally applied the pain test. And the pain test was putting the hand in cold ice water and, you know, measuring the time they could keep the hand in the middle It's a validated test and it's used for pain per se. And there was no difference between females and children. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. The problem with this test is that it's been shown that. People, for example, top supporters, they perceive the same pain, but they just can prolong longer. So yes. Again, this is also very difficult to interpret it, how long somebody can sustain the test, we, which will he will say, okay, I have this pain, which will be the same as somebody else, who just stopped earlier. So again, it's, it's so hard to interpret the result then. Yeah. Yes, but I think you say, and pain, you know, if, if, if you are a coach potato and you have, uh, and you, you might have faster and AMS development than if you are, are a heart sportive that uh, really survives a long under, under pain conditions. Yeah. Have you thought about, because in the end of all three diseases, AMS, HAC and HAP, only MRI difference um, changes to why it matter? That has been described by HAC is the most objective test. Have you thought about doing maybe pre So this is <laughs> this is a literature review. Yeah. Uh, but I would say that if you think about where most of these high altitude mountains and where most of the studies are taking place, and then whether or not there's an MRI machine available nearby, uh, that might be a little difficult. I will say that this discussion is fascinating, but it does bring up the need for more studies on haste, because at least then we have a little bit of objective findings with the ataxia and the encephalopathy that an outsider can witness those things. And with only four studies on HACE, we probably need more, but the incidence of HACE is so much lower and it makes it very difficult to study. Maybe just one point to that. We did a study in 2013 and we examined all the subjects before and after by MRI. And we found uh, in three subjects of 15 who submitted uh, we found this hemorrhage in the corpus callosum, which, which is uh, predictive, or it, it suggests that they had haze, but clinically they didn't have any haze. And the mm. only difference they showed compared to the others was that they had a significantly lower oxygen saturation throughout the expedition. So you might suggest that hypoxia leads also to this brain barrier damage and might even be present without the clinical, really clinical symptoms of mm. pain. So we might mm. miss some of these patients. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. so there's time for three questions. <laughs> you like the first. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I've been myself many times in Nepal, and Nepal is a good um, field to look at many trekking people and expedition people. and. When they get sick, normally they were transported by helicopter to the hospital in Kathmandu. And do we have maybe Dili, maybe you also might have some data. If you look at um, those people who were transported to the uh, to the hospital, um, if you look at the numbers of female and male with hape and haze, maybe mm. you could, uh, find some differences. Mm. Yeah, do you have to you have the problem of knowing you need to know the total number of people who w went up because mm. if you don't have a good and this is a problem with almost all this work is it often looks like there's more men but overall there's more men doing these activities and so unless you have the actual denominator and you can do it by percentages can't can i comment on that real quick yeah i've been i've been working in the hospital the spring season and we did not have a single women case of AMS. Yeah. Wow. We did have which hospital? Where? Uh, oh, wow. wow. But again, that it's was a very tough. quiet season. Yeah. There was um, seven. The, like, yeah. the emergency cases all from transport yeah. to Kathmandu yeah. immediately. So this is mm. subjective. 
you have yeah, three months. That's fascinating. Expedition dogs and also I'm a tracking guide and um, okay, um, I have been many times in Nepal and other countries as well. And um, all my haze and hate patients were all men. Mm -hmm. and Interesting. Not that much. Some women, but mostly also AMS was more in in men. And I think it's a kind of problem with the psychology because men uh, they don't talk about their problems if they have some mm. they like to ignore because they they um they are anxious they think if they admit that they're not well they will be sent back mm. and normally you, you can change uh you can change the way of approach if somebody is not acclimatizing well you can slow and uh, make and do a rest day mm -hmm. um and this um normally i I, I also wanted to go to the top of the mountain <laughs> to go back with the patient. And therefore, in those times, we could uh, change the acclimatizing um, away to how to approach to the, to the mountain, for example. But now um, the time is very strict and the, um, the expeditions and all the trekkings are more shorter than maybe 20 years ago, 10 years mm, ago. Yeah. And there's not so much flexibility now because everything is uh booked in advance and you cannot say okay and make a rest day here and the whole group will start the next day so this is one, way, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we have one question we can come back to that yeah i had a question that was off a slightly different angle has anybody tried other than your pediatric bracket has anybody tried breaking down all the hate paste data by age because if the difference between men and women is 10%, and the difference between 20 year olds and 70 year olds mm -hmm. is 100%. Hold that thought. Yeah. It's yeah. going to come up later. It's going to come up later. <laughs> <laughs> it is interesting. Who was it? I'm sorry. Important. Yeah. Be interesting to know in which uh, menstrual cycle causes uh, women were, have they asked them for. Because uh, in different uh, parts of the cycle, we have so, different level of estrogen and progesterone. The the single study on that found no difference in the menstrual cycles. Uh, it was a U.S. military paper on on women in the military, and they found no differences. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 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 So I introduced Jacqueline, so you don't have to introduce yourself. <laughs> Jacqueline is um, um, a pulmonologist and a sports medicine physician and has a lot of experience in expeditions as well. And we are very happy that you're here and that you give a talk about pains. Yeah, help. <laughs> Yeah, it's really a great pleasure to talk to you here about the topic I worked on with the UEIAA uh, Medcom Writing Group, and it's about HAPE. And the question of my talk is, does sex make a difference to HAPE susceptibility? HAPE stands for High Altitude Pulmonary Edema, and it's a non-cardiogenic hypermeability edema. Usually it occurs above 2,500 to 3,000 meters, and it occurs usually during early exposure to hypobaric hypoxia. The prevalence varies, varies widely between 0.2% when you ascend very slow to 4,500 meters, but the prevalence increases with increasing ascent rate. So, it might be as high as 15% when you ascend very fast to 5,500 meters. And it has even been shown that in HAPE susceptibles, the prevalence increases up to 60% or more when you ascend very fast to 4,000 
500 meter to the Gabana Margarita hut. Usually, moderate to severe AMS symptoms are present, but HAPE can really occur without any preceding symptoms of AMS. An excessive increase in hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction leading to a pulmonary, increased pulmonary capillary pressure, which is then very inhomogeneous, is the mainstay of this disease, and this leads to a capillary leakage and consecutive edema. Most of you know very good the symptoms of uh, pulmonary edema. What is very striking and many mountaineers, they report really on a very sudden drop in performance as if the fuel, fuel is running out. So that is something that of the mountaineers describe. You see here also the signs of hate, which are not at all specific or sensitive. And you might also not be able to uh, transfer these cutoff values to other altitudes than 4,500 meters. For example, you see here the. Oops, a lot. One spec. Yeah. You see here uh, on 6,100 meters, that's my oxygen saturation and my resting heart rate. And I felt somehow a, a, a drop in performance. At but based on this value, you just can't decide whether this is HAPE or not, especially if you don't have any preceding measurements. So at the end, and you see also uh, the, the other signs, there's a huge overlap with other diseases, differential diagnosis as lower respiratory tract infection or lung embolism. If it's not in a study, it's for me personally, it's a difficult diagnosis if it's not full the full picture of HAPE. The aim of this uh, scoping review was to summarize the current knowledge on sex differences in HAPE on the topics of epidemiology, pathophysiology, symptoms and the treatment of HAPE. Uh, we therefore made a huge literature search and I screened around 500 papers, whether these are relevant for the topic or not. And very disappointingly, you find seven papers to be included in this review so a lot of work with very few output i won't go into details right now here but it's worth mentioning that most of the studies uh, were done at lower levels of high altitude uh, most or all of the uh, studies were case series many of them retrospective and we go into the results afterwards i would like to highlight so some issues before we discussed it already but you see the data on that for example, here, the demographics who were retrospectively assessed from Mount Denali, they included more than 20,000 climbers, of whom 50, more than 50% reached the summit. And they showed on the left, you see it, the second line, only 2.1% were women during the period of 1990 to 1994, and the percentage increased slightly to 11.1, but that's not much. And they showed also, you see it here, that female were slightly less likely to reach the summit with 45% compared to 52% in May. Then we see some data from Mount Everest, which was collected by Billy. Uh, thanks to Billy, we have this information. They compared the period between 2006 and 2090 compared to the earlier periods. And in the, the area of 1990 to 2005, there were only 9% uh, women, and this proportion increased a bit to 14.6%. Mountaineers got a bit older, the chance to reach the summit increased substantially. And you see on the left down, you see the total numbers per year. This means 2.5 women per year during the 1953 to 1989 and to 52 person or women during the years of 2006 to 2019. In this study, women were equally likely to reach the summit and both could increase during these periods the success rate from above 30 to almost 70%. So 
what does this mean? That's what we discussed before. There's still women are still the minority who are exposed to these altitudes. All the studies included in the scoping review showed consistently an increased presentation of men with hay, but only two studies highlighted in yellow uh, somehow made a relation to the proportion of people exposed at all. I will go into details of these studies shortly. This is a study from Colorado published in 1986. It was also a retrospective case series. They uh, checked the data of 47 hate cases. The di diagnosis was there uh, verified with a chest X-ray and only three women, 7% had hate, whereas 43 men were included in this study. Uh, representing 93%. They concluded that this corresponds to a 30 time reduced risk of developing HAPE in women. They based their interpretation on touristic information from the ski lift ticket sales and calculated the prevalence for men for HAPE of 10 to 100,000, whereas in women the prevalence was 0.74 per 100,000, so, so a huge difference. The next study from the same area 10 years later, also a retrospective analysis, which uh, assessed the medical records of 150 patients. Interesting, I think the very low oxygen saturation of 74 at this altitude, which might correspond to a high altitude pulmonary edema, 85, 85 had lung rails in the examination and 88% showed pulmonary infiltrates in the chest X-ray. They found 16% women and 84% men of the hate cases. And also here was, it was suggested based on another study and touristic data that this uh, increased presentation of men corresponds to an increased susceptibility of men to hate. When we think about this possible increased prevalence of HAPE in men, we, we should discuss the rationale behind some pathophysiological mechanisms, but also the confounders. It is suggested that hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, which leads to the increase in pulmonary capillary pressure, is attenuated in females due to the presence of female sex hormones. These, this assumption or the, this suggestion is based on uh, animal studies mainly. We have a study in children where they showed that after the age of 11, around 11, uh, also males had a higher incidence of hay. But I don't know if this is really um, transferable to, to our topic. Then also the sex difference in hypoxic ventilatory response is discussed we still not know, but it is suggested that, a, that an increase in hypoxic ventilatory, how much you ventilate based on a, 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 a hypoxic stimulus is increased in women due to the um, sex hormones also and should be protective to develop HAPE. But there's a huge overlap also in HAPE susceptible. Some of those show really normal hypoxic ventilatory response. So for me, there's a, a big question, especially even if these effects contribute to this increased uh, prevalence and incidence, it might not be as much the difference between men and women based on these effects. Then also clearly that the studies is signed with case series, which are not designed to answer this question at all, is a problem and therefore the data is just not uh, it's not possible for a generalization to a wider population. Researcher biases and gender biases might be a problem as well. And we discussed already the demographic difference. And also here, I, I personally believe that behavioral differences between men and women might contribute very much to these differences, especially if we know that prevalence is depending on how you behave. And we don't have that much information in the study to conclude whether behavior might be similar or not. So this is personally for me a, a big question, which could 
lead to the findings we have now. So the conclusion based on that is that the data suggests a reduced susceptibility to hate in women, but that the data is surely not, um, it's not possible to uh, generalize it for a wider population and that behavioral differences might contribute very much to these effects found. Then you might maybe, um, or that's also why we don't adapt the key recommendations. I, I think it's not, if we formulate that uh, women are less susceptible, this might implicate we can loosen our recommendations for for women when it comes to hate, and this, this is clearly not the case. So we still recommend the, the same as for men, which is uh, not to increase the ascent rate above 500 meters per day and to include the rest days, as you have seen it in the UEIAA uh, video on AMS and high altitude illnesses. The mainstay of the treatment of HAPE is also always a rapid and assisted descent. So bring the sick people down, give them oxygen as much as you have. This might be very limited and you should know how much oxygen you have. Then clearly indicated are pulmonary vasodilators. The best, re the best studies are uh, for nifedipine, but also sildenafil and tadalafil are reported to be effective. So you can give all of them. And in remote area, you, uh, Mia has already um, pointed on that, the increased, if you have HAIP, your risk to develop haze as well is as high. That's why we um, advise to give dexamethasone in addition. And in moderate cases, but this must be taken with caution, it might be sufficient to give patients only oxygen and pulmonary vasodilators, but is really depending on where you are and how severe the disease is. And in any doubt, you should always descend with the patient. In our opinion, chemoprophylaxis is recommended when all the preventive strategies are taken into account and only secondarily we advise for a chemoprophylaxis with nifedipine or tadalafil. As you might have seen in my presentation, I got somehow performance within the title and <laughs> this is difficult because we decided after many discussions uh, in to exclude this topic from the recommendation because it's a very huge topic where very inhomogeneous uh, how people were exposed to hypoxia and that's why we excluded it but i will just show you shortly uh, some data from our last expedition we made at himlung himal in nepal the study was performed in 2013 where we sent uh, uh, Ascent Himalung Himal, which is a 7,000 meter peak in Nepal. We included in total 39 participants, of whom were 18 women. The age was 45 around, and we did exercise tests up to 6,000 meter. We also tried to make uh, exercise tests at 7,000 meters. You see here uh, the climbing share pot with this 90 kilo a uh, cycle ergometer. We, we prepared one to make three parts, but they preferred to take it in one. But it was too cold and everything was just frozen and the time was running and we couldn't perform the tests up there. But also the, the question of this study wasn't whether women are different to men. The question was whether uh, cardiopulmonary exercise tests and uh, parameters of ventilation perfusion mismatch predicts whether uh, predict summit success or acute mountain sickness. That was the question. And we could show there that uh, in the pretests, uh, uh, VO2 max below 49 milliliter per minute per kilogram was associated with a 83% uh, chance of not reaching the summit. And this, this association was even more pronounced at 4,500 meter, where uh, VO2 max below, below 
35 was associated with a risk of 91% to not reach the summit. But besides, we saw, as we know from, from real life, that women had lower VO2 max compared to men. This is true as in lowlands as at altitude. But we also saw that these females were less likely to summit the, the, the Himlung Himal. This is just a short glimpse of what we did there and what we could find out for exercise performance. And you see, there's there's a lot to do. We need we need better studies, including more women, maybe including only women, or we need much more data on how people behave when they go to altitude. But we also need, when it comes to height, better diagnostic tools, maybe lung ultra or lung ultrasound of more sensitive than than making a radiograph so we probably miss a lot of hate and there is also of course the the problem of gender biases that we misinterpret hate many hate probably in women as being not that fit or as hyperventilation or as well i i i remember a very good case from switzerland where where they rescued a woman because she she had a problem with respiration, she had really dyspnea. They made a blood gas analysis, and of course she had a low PCO2. She was hyperventilating, but she was severely hypoxemic, and the diagnosis was hyperventilation. So it, it was just clear, and I'm not sure if I think for this topic maybe a woman gets easier the diagnosis of hyperventilation than a man. So we all of us we we need to be cautious on these problems and it's still not resolved so many many more questions and that's the end already right. any questions more comment we anyway have a problem of power as women but here we have a serious uh, problem of power in in a statistical way uh, when i see your your example of three women compared to more than 20 men and they really make a difference and, and make a very clear statement this really gives me um, some some headache or whatever um, so <laughs> we have had the same discussion with hypothermia uh, where you also have rare rare cases and the only chance that we had is is to to create a register and and now we are really collecting cases and and Beat Walpott from geneva he was able to make now a first evaluation of, of all the cases from the hypothermia registry and it was um, successfully um, published in resuscitation. So it is possible to gain more um, really good power when, when you try to, to collect the cases and, and make a register. Maybe this could be a possibility. Yeah, this is of course a good idea. I think many, many hate cases, they, they don't go to the the medical doctor because they feel better when they go down and they just think oh well it's it wasn't that good so i think we miss many of these cases so but the problem is always the denominator yeah we don't, yeah. We don't know how many yeah. people are exposed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes jacqueline i was wondering just kind of along the lines about what helen was talking about with gender specific medicine earlier I'm wondering, as a pulmonologist, do you see any difference in people with pulmonary hypertension in how men versus women? I know mean, it's much more than women, but do they respond differently to pulmonary vasodilators? And is that do you think that's a fruitful area for um, investigation in terms of yeah. sex differences? It's a very good point. Maybe it's not for all of them here clear that we see many more idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension in women compared to men so there's the other way around but the pathophysiology behind is different than to hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction so it's not really comparable uh, it 
which is the same treatment as for hate for pulmonary arterial hypertension. So the problem also there, the, the group of PAH patients are so inhomogeneous. There are very different diseases. We have the very young women with no additional diseases at all. And we have the severely diseased patients with systemic sclerosis, for example. So there are many other factors which might which might influence also the the effect of therapy. And I, I doubt that this will help for HAPE at all because we have too many confounders there. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, that that's true. Yeah. I got didn't got. Yeah, yeah, and they cope better with hypoxia in the early phase. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are many, um, uh, how do you call it? Yeah. It might be, but whether this has an impact then on adults with hate, we would suggest that menopausal women should have an increased incidence. I, I think probably it's just a mixture of all that we have main, probably we have differences in women and men, but whether this is that much pronounced, I doubt. I think there's a, a huge part, a behavioral part. We don't even know the real data because we miss that many subjects with hate. Uh, so uh, there are many, many questions, I think. I, I can't answer really. Yeah. I, I wanted to know about the these cases of hate you say we miss, probably because they are not. Uh, strong enough or hard mm -hmm. enough. So I wonder, because there is always, uh, which is the risk of that? Because uh, there is always the risk of overdiagnosis when you start studying uh, some illness and you go deep inside. So if those cases we miss in uh, hey, are relevant or not, should be interesting to know what happens. They one of the questions to put is they avoid the, the summit. They are really sick and they say nothing and just when they are down they feel better. Or there's something that it, it's not strictly necessary to put the level of diagnosis of hate down because it can be done like cholesterol or hypertension that we are always lowering the, the levels. Yeah, yeah. I I think I got the point. It's it's important to miss those cases we miss probably are they important? Do we know what happens there or not? I think really it is important when we see the data that subjects with a very low oxygen saturation they had a disruption of brain uh, blood barrier with bleedings without having symptoms. I think in medical terms this is very important. And we might misclassify maybe some of haze and hape as accidents. And yes, I think we should know, but it's it's very difficult to make the diagnosis sometimes when being in an expedition. But also there, I think good expeditions le expedition leader, they, the, the, the point there is sending the people down. So it, at the end, it doesn't really matter whether it was haze or hape, but having people deciding you're not strong enough or there's something wrong and sending these people down we we won't make the diagnosis and I, i'm on a way i'm i'm um, it's clear we we tr we think it's more frequent maybe than it is uh, i also thought we we made long ultrasound in during expedition and for me it was clear that we'll we'll find a lot of comet tails that with these pulmonary artery pressures you must have a leakage of the vasculature and it wasn't the case so yeah maybe but still it I, I believe we didn't understand the one point from hape it's not just increasing pulmonary artery pressure and to having this puzzle bit better together 
would maybe help. But in real life, it's very often very difficult to, to make the correct diagnosis. Yeah, well, I think we then proceed. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Jacqueline. So it's next speaker is Lenka. Yes. So and we are very pleased that you are here. I mean, because she is a ICU doctor in her country in the Czechoslovakia. Czech Czechoslovakia. Sorry, she is the president of the um, Czech Mountain, Mountain Medicine Society. And she got birth to a baby just very recently. And she really helped to write up this article, which I find really impressive. And not many men probably would do that. <laughs> uh, thank you for this uh, nice uh, introduction. So I come from the Czech Republic. Uh, unfortunately, the highest peak in the Czech Republic is 1,600 meters. So no high altitude. At uh, in the Czech Republic, but what you can uh, see there and visit there if you are a keen climber and mountaineer are these impressive uh, sandstone um, sandstone towers uh, with very difficult climbing on them and even jumping from one uh, tower to uh, to another. Even I've even seen a pregnant women doing this uh, kind of <laughs> uh, activity. But I'm going to talk about uh, contraception at high altitude. So since now we've discussed the uh, progesterone and estrogen, the, uh, the female hormones uh, from the natural cycle, uh, from the natural uh, menstrual cycle. But now we'll, uh, I want to talk a little bit about contraception. So when the intake of these hormone, uh, hormones is uh, artificial, um, well, the, the term contraception, can you just move on? Thank you. The term contraception is uh, is quite uh, wide. So uh, obviously we've got barrier contraception and then uh, hormonal con contraception, uh, which can and that can be applied either systemically or regional uh, as a vaginal ring or intrauterine uh, device. But uh, most of uh, my talk will be about oral contraceptives, either uh, combined or uh, progesterone only. And why we are talking about it, we know that there is an increase, uh, in increasing number of uh, women taking uh, these hormonal contraceptives when they uh, travel to uh, high altitude. So the previous uh, studies, which were mainly questioners, uh, they saw uh, around 20% of women uh, taking oral contraceptives when they were tracking uh, usually uh, that is there trekking around 5,000 meters. Uh, but the, the recent questionnaires found uh, even uh, one in three women uh, in, uh, in their fertile per period taking hormone contraceptives. Uh, I think my uh, my colleagues has already mentioned uh, have already mentioned that uh, it's not easy to um, do a good uh, literature review uh, for uh, all of these uh, topics. Even uh, even for my topic, I was uh, struggling with the number of uh, of uh, relevant studies, uh, and you can see that. Uh, uh, not all of them were uh, took place at real high high altitude. Uh, nearly half of them uh, were from simulated high altitude uh, from a hyperbaric chamber. And the problem is for these hyperbaric chambers, the exposure to the, this, the hypoxia is usually quite uh, short. It, the, most of the studies were uh, just about just a couple of hours uh, long. Uh, and then we rely on uh, case reports. And that was mentioned here as well, that uh, we have these re reported, uh, uh, for example, thrombosis uh, and other problems um, related to hormonal contraceptive intake but then we don't know what's the what's the basic population uh, and what I find also uh, quite difficult uh, when we want to draw recommendations based on these papers is that in most of the studies I mean the experimental ones uh, the hormonal contraceptives were used basically uh, to uh, to 
make the same like a level of the hormones for all, all, all the participants. So they don't want to have the interference uh, with the natural menstrual cycle uh, as one uh, factor for, for the experiment. So they used, uh, they used the hormonal uh, contraceptives for that. And also some of the studies were comparing these women with uh, I would say like artificial hormonal uh, intake to a group of men. Uh, so I find also difficult to draw conclusions from uh, these kind of uh, studies. Uh, so I will try to, uh, so the, if I, if I say the main fact we, uh, I found in all the studies was that uh, uh, there are no advantages or disadvantages in, uh, in acclimatization or performance uh, for women who are on uh, oral contraceptives. And uh, also, uh, as far as we know, uh, the, uh, the contraceptive uh, uh, efficacy is not uh, influenced by the short-term high altitude sojourn. Uh, so, uh, I would like to probably go a little bit uh, more practical. So, I've prepared a couple of questions which maybe uh, women might ask about uh, taking uh, oral contraceptives when they, when they go to a uh, high altitude. And again, we don't have a high altitude uh, picture, so again, you can see our centaur. Um, so, the first uh, question might be, is there anything I, I should do, uh, something special when I'm taking uh, oral contraceptives? Uh, definitely, it's, it, needs, it should be discussed with the gynecologist who knows the, who knows the woman. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it's wise to, uh, you, uh, to set up the regimen of the hormonal contraceptives uh, well before uh, your high altitude journey, especially if it's a longer expedition. Uh, it's wise not to change uh, the, the way of uh, taking these hormones uh, just uh, a minute before your uh, plane is, uh, is um, uh, taking off. Uh, well, one problem which we may face is uh, breakthrough uh, bleeding. Uh, it's common not uh, just in oral contraceptive users, but even in non-users. Uh, we think that there are uh, different uh, factors affecting this, uh, even even uh, uh, time changes, uh, changes, uh, changes in uh, in diet, and so on. So uh, we should always uh, bear in mind this. Uh, and uh, when we know we are traveling to a place where there is a, a different time uh, time zone for the oral contraceptive users, it's wise probably to adjust the time of uh, of uh, taking the pill, especially when the when the low dose uh, oral contraceptives are in uh, use. Um, some women uh, take oral contraceptives also for their period uh, control, menstrual cycle control. Uh, it's uh, quite wise because the hygiene problems and sanitary uh, pet disposal might be an issue. And uh, as far as we know from the literature, it is safe to use your oral contraceptives for a longer period, for several months in a row. But again, it's uh, wise to set uh, this regimen well before you well before you go uh, on the journey. And still, uh, uh, we should be prepared for the uh, breakthrough uh, bleeding. Uh, one advantage, which was uh, mentioned by uh, some of the some of the papers and opinions is that uh, it can prevent even the menstrual symptoms, which they may be, which might be in, uh, confused with some of the AMS, uh, AMS symptoms. Uh, and uh, obviously, there are other ways how uh, either hormone uh, hormone containing drugs, uh, which can uh, which can be used to suppress the menstrual uh, bleeding, but that should be discussed with the, uh, with the gynecologist uh, well in advance. Uh, again, uh, my uh, my colleagues has already mentioned have already mentioned that, the, that there might be the uh, 
the uh, influence of uh, progesterone. We've discussed the hypoxic ventilator response here already. Uh, as far as I've uh, gone through the literature, uh, when the subgroup of uh, oral contraceptive users were discussed, there was not find any advantage or uh, disadvantage in uh, in um, acclimatization or AMS uh, risk. The only uh, the only paper again already discussed here uh, was this one from uh, from the South Pole where the uh, users and the oral contraceptive users were uh, had uh, more AMS and uh, and also the acetazolamide uh, was ineffective in this group of uh, in this group of P of uh, women. Uh, when we talk about acetazolamide, uh, we may discuss also other medications. So that might be another uh, another question: Can I use other medication when I'm using uh, hormone or oral uh, contraceptives uh, at high, high altitude? Uh, I think most mainly antimicrobial drugs are uh, discussed. Uh, but uh, again, as far as we know, there are no problems with. Uh, 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 in use with uh, the oral contraceptives and uh, antimicrobial. The only exception is the rifampicin uh, group of uh, of um, drugs of antibiotics. Uh, just uh, what we need to keep in mind that uh, diarrhea may change uh, the uh, may change the pharmacokinetics of the hormone or oral contraceptives, so uh, it might not be that uh, efficient. Uh, and again, uh, uh, very uh, painful and very uh, and uh, a topic which is uh, discussed a lot as well is the risk of thrombosis in uh, women taking uh, hormone uh, contraceptives.
of a woman taking contraceptive, but with two superficial thrombosis, I and no thrombosis, but superficial. Okay. In Ferice, when I was working in right. Ferice, one in the in the arm and one in the leg, <laughs> but it was superficial. Yes, I see. I, see. I myself, I had what? a thrombosis in in my lower knee, but in the abs, I was um, camping in uh, in. Um, okay. Uh, three thousand meters and did some four thousand meter peaks and then I went back home to Garmisch without having a break, without taking enough drinks. And okay. I had um I was in my menopause and I had some drug um drugs contraceptive contraceptive uh, contraceptive. Hormone, 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 yeah. placement, thank you. And I, on the time I smoked a little bit because of that. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yes, yes and, okay. this, and this combination. Yes. Uh, yes. I went home and the next day I had a little ankle swelling yes. in the ankle. And I thought, oh, I didn't have uh, enough exercise and I run up the hill in little while. Right. Next day I had some um, edema in my knees. And then I said, oh, this is not, this is a different thing. Yes. And I went to the hospital. And I did a um, sonography, and I had a, a small thrombosis in my upper leg, uh, a lower leg, lower leg. And yeah. then I had some, some for three months, and it, it, well, it can yeah. even occur here. No, I, want, I want to complete uh, David's remark um, because I, I have given courses to mountain guides in France for many years, and. Sometimes some of them told me they had, uh, they were men. At this time, there was no women, <laughs> or only one or two. But uh, some of them told them that they have a, a deep venous thrombosis on return from expedition. But and I, I say them the same thing as David, because when they come back from expedition. They drink alcohol because they are happy or because they are sad. <laughs> <laughs> flight back and they want to sleep so they take a sleeping pill and they don't don't move during all the flight and then they have a deep venous thrombosis when they arrive back in France but uh, after I have sent the questionnaire to all the all the mountain guides in France I have collected maybe 15 cases like this and we could explore some of them. And they all had factor five letter, and they didn't know that before. So maybe in, in women, maybe right. we have to explore yes. those who yes. have yes. kind of problems. Yes. Because in general, uh, the women are not here for the same Yeah, I, yes. I would like to. I would like to say that for uh, for for the case reports, the all. The, all three his reports I have uh, I have in the literature list. There were really women taking or or some hormones like oral contraceptives or hormone replacement therapy. They were at high altitude and they suffer from venous thrombosis. But the question is, is there really an additive risk? To this, these women, I, I don't, I don't want to say that there is no increased risk for thrombosis at high altitude. There, there is, but then the question is, should we uh, recommend or should we say something special to these women when they are taking oral contraceptives, and um, they are going to high altitude? And as far as I can see, what we know now, there, yeah, I think uh, there is not anything special they they should do they should be cautious they they they, they have the increased risk when the gynecologist is already prescribing the 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 drug but i think because some some the rec some of the recommendations they are questioning i don't know uh low molecular weight heparin or something special uh i i don't think we should recommend something like that so just basic basic recommendations well, your practice right and check before you go to the, yeah, yeah but that's the but yeah. the, that's the gynecologist's uh, job that's yeah, that's I mean, the, yeah. and they should do it before they even uh, give the uh, the initial prescription general recommendation for everybody is to uh, avoid dehydration yeah yeah the, yeah water yeah. 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 Might I have a comment uh, from uh, from the internet? I'm sorry, I'm I'm a gynecologist and obstetrician. 
Yes, 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 please. Yes, please. If, it, if it's possible, I, I would have loved to be in one of my favorite places in Pontresina and Diavoletta, but unfortunately I couldn't be there. Um, I'm a mountain doctor, uh, being climbing in the Swiss Alps mostly for 15 years and being pregnant on the Alps uh, with first trimester and also with a, a second trimester ski touring, mountaineering. But um, from from the data that we know from uh, gynecology is that basically um, the most elevated risk of deep venous thrombosis and pul pulmonary embolism is basically within the first six months of uh, starting that appeal. Um, we also uh, find out those uh, women that we, of course, we cannot uh, test the whole population that is starting oral contraceptive or combined pills with acetyl, that we find out the light and mutation, so um, elevated uh, levels of factor five. But we know certainly that um, factor seven is um, activated or overactivated when you start to take some pills with acetyl. We know it. And therefore, um, I, I think it's basically the combination of genes, um, whether you get uh, keep hydrated during the expedition. I know, for, for, for example, I don't want to carry enough water uh, to the mountaintops. So everybody's a little bit dehydrated. Uh, do you maybe on a longer expeditions or on higher altitude cross the limits of um, being a little bit more activated on the thrombosis side, and especially if you have injuries, you, you are immobilized, of course, then the, the risk is a lot higher than, um, than when you are just moving all the time. So it's basically a combination of everything. But what I tell my patients back home is that I wouldn't start newly appeal if you are going up to the altitude. Um, just to several, due to several factors, is that um, you have, of, of course, the spotting that everybody hates. Um, you have the elevated risk of uh, thrombosis when you are starting a new pill. So it just changes your uh, mechanism, the thrombosis system in your body. And therefore, um, I, I think if you have used a pill for a longer time, it's a lot, lot safer. But um, then, if you want to be on the safer side, you would just go well uh, progesterone only pill. Or um, I'm I'm originally from Finland, so we love love the, the hormonal IUDs that basically uh, keeps you hormonally normal, doesn't activate the thrombosis, and basically within maybe half a year you are without any menstruation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. We should still have this video. First, what I was, I was, I was going to ask you something similar, what she just um, kind of answered. I was wondering whether, because you had on your last slide that you would recommend a woman who does not take any oral contraception to start like a really short time before, before actually leaving for the expedition. But I was wondering whether, like, first time, whether this is a like good advice because I'm assuming or. The, what I've the experience I've made after a certain degree of altitude, you most women don't menstruate because you know you're you're exercising quite a lot and it's not really a natural condition for surrounded for the human body. So um, the the hygiene aspect, you would have that you you have that on the mountain anyway, whether you're you're you know menstruating or not. So I'm wondering whether how how strong the recommendation really is for a woman who does not take any sort of hormonal medication at all to really start that. Because as we thought before, we have the long flight, if you're not lucky and living in the Kathmandu, you have to get that, um, or, you know, any other type of things. So there's like several risks for, for thrombosis, I'm guessing. Are there, like, is there any data on that? Yes, we bought, so we bought you some paint. You could summarize somebody. We didn't really understand, like the non English speaking person behind here, what this lady was telling us. Maybe you can read words. So, so what, what was, what did he say? Yeah. I, I think the question is do you really recommend that women start this in order to suppress yeah, menstruation? Oh, no, 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 we, no, we, we didn't forget it. You know, maybe. Oh, yeah. 
what she was saying is that the risk of thrombosis is higher when you first start the pills than once you've been on them for a while. The biggest risk seems to be in those first several months. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason to start early. Mm -hmm. um, and she was also promoting the IUD as um, oh, not having the whole the hormonal risk of uh, increased risk of thrombosis at all. Right. And and the mini pill or the oh, or, the or the yeah, low progesterone yeah progesterone mm -hmm. only yes and uh, doctor online correct me if, is there anything else that I missed immobilization yeah, sure. to be yeah. to be aware sure. that you are taking contraceptives yeah. where you kind of yeah. 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 Right. get up and walk uh, around and play sure. which is important yes. Yes. In my opinion, yes. Yes. It's the most important yes. on the planes and yes. so coming back to this question, I think it's an important one. The new generation maybe thinks different about mm -hmm. the men. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I understand. So, so, and you, you mentioned the the the, 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 hormone, uh, the, the, the hygiene aspect. So, well, well, it's a really good question. What is the answer? Yeah, <laughs> it's really a personal issue. Yes. I think it depends very much how comfortable you feel yourself mm. it maybe depends also where you go and w what kind of a trek expedition it is mm -hmm. uh, yeah but it, it's it's very personal yeah Absolutely. There's, there's a nice article on the conversation.com about how difficult it is for menstruating women at the antarctica station so i recommend everyone that <laughs> it will make you an activist <laughs> So, what question here? Um, I'm actually quite scared of asking this and saying this. Uh, I'm a male GP. Um, and um, you I always try and say to myself, what would I do in this position? Um, but of course, I'm not a lady. But I do advise quite a lot of women who spend a considerable amount of time at my altitude, professionally or on prolonged expeditions. On, on contraception. And I tend to recommend um, depot injections. Um, you don't get the problem, as long as they've been on them for a considerable time before they go, and it usually becomes their method of choice at any altitude, they're not going to be worried by diarrhea. If you're stuck out on a bivouac for a couple of days in a storm, you don't have to worry about having anything with you. I mean, it just strikes me as a man, as an incredibly logical thing to do. Unless I was planning to get pregnant after I got back to the expedition, which I yeah. can go. No, um, I, I tend to agree with Jacqueline. It, it's a very personal matter, and everybody needs to know what she wants to do. And we are simply there to, you know, help us potential increased risk of deep venous thrombosis. I think we, we need to do that and we need to inform uh, the women that this is a potential risk that is there. Yeah, really and and I, mean, not... I can maybe personally, I have taken um, hormonal uh, replacement therapy many, many times in the, in the, in the in the mountains and for instance on the mount mckinley you know and i was very happy not to have to deal with menstruation there you mm -hmm. know i mean absolutely you have no water it's extremely cold you're happy to have a, a <laughs> least <laughs> cross the, the, the least problems um you know for your, your personal hygiene but again you know we can take away this this potential risk of uh, what we all know when uh, when the contraceptive is combined with dehydration with cold with constrictive closing i mean every you know many other factors come into play yeah i would just add on that i think that one of the one of the key messages from this talk is that uh, this is one of the issues we should we should just plan uh, when we are planning the expedition and if we want to that we should think of it and if you want to do something about about our period about the menstruation we should plan in advance and discuss it uh with uh with the kind of coaches because each each woman is different there are other risk factors and everything so the the 
in my opinion, the worst thing is to try to deal with it two days before you fly to Kathmandu yeah. and go to 7,000. Yeah, I have one question. We heard now several times about this doctor by flying, you know, I'm actually an orthopedic surgeon, I don't understand this, but would it be wise to test all this before the expedition? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we did a lot of coagulation studies and it's also there quite complex we have both we have on one hand we have an activation of coagulation but we have also a consumption of factors probably so and when you when you hear um we have also bleeding we have bleeding in in the uh in the eyes so i wouldn't change uh, so if somebody has has hasn't had any thrombotic events before i wouldn't go into this topic and we in earlier years the recommendation for factor of infliting were much stronger for anticoagulation than they are now so the risk is probably not that high we check all our participants for every expedition we had always a lot of factor five light and mutations also in combination with protrombin and, and etc and they we had we had two um known we had one bilateral central pulmonary embolism mm -hmm. without factor of and we had a thrombotic myocardial infarction also no factor of mm -hmm. so i think we should always advise for all the protected uh, possibilities, hydration, uh, yes. moving, and, and so on. But otherwise, I wouldn't check everything we can. Okay. <laughs> that means a great power. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your help. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for your help.
short points. Uh, we want really to clarify that we are very happy to have also men in the, in the order. <laughs> <laughs> and we want to be very inclusive, but I think for most of you, you feel comfortable as well. I hope yes. so. And okay, thank you. Um, yes, uh, obviously, uh, that's not a problem. So let's let's get the, the last three um, talks done. The first, I want to introduce um, Dominique Jean, and she is really what we say uh, an old elephant in the field yeah. um, i mean we don't have the female expression so far but we will find it she's a pediatrician um she's an expedition doctor she's an infectious disease specialist she's involved in uh, in high altitude medicine in tracking guiding and just it's her life you know we feel that when she's talking to you Thanks, Dominic, to be here. Thank you, Sylvie. Okay, thank you, Sylvie. Um, pregnancy in our working group, pregnancy now is not really written because Len Guy is in charge of this topic. Len Guy is she's here. Uh, she was a previous uh, speaker. And she has worked a lot on contraception, and now she's working on pregnancy mm -hmm. uh, with my supervision. <laughs> but so it, I will not present what I've done the group now, but I will present what I have done before because I'm working on this topic for many years now. And uh, so I will begin. This is a view from my uh, room at home. Oh. <laughs> doesn't work okay i will take this so when when i'm working on my computer i can reuse it okay so on a practical point of view we will try to answer some questions on, because i have consultations with a pregnant woman and this question are usual so can i trek around anapuna can i climb kilimanjaro i, I had a recent consultation with this can I spend my pregnancy in La Paz? There are families who expatriate to La Paz because they have a job there. And we will try to explain that. Oh, yes, it works. Okay. Um, so the first question is travel. Travel to exotic, exotic countries on in remote areas. And the first problem are before altitude, uh, sometimes these problems. Um, for a pregnant woman, it is important to understand that in this country, maybe they will have limited medical care if they need obstetrical assistance, usually in uh, trekking areas or expedition areas. You can meet some doctors, but there are more uh, uh, traumatologist than obstetrician or gynecologist. So it is better not to have problems when you are pregnant in uh, remote, remote areas. Uh, some infectious disease may be more dangerous during pregnancy for the mother or for the fetus or for both. Uh, some diarrhea, if you have tourista with dehydration, it's not very good. Malaria may be more dangerous in pregnant women. Dengue, Zika, hepatitis E. Hepatitis E is dangerous on, in third trimester. So usually you don't go to expedition during third trimester. Yeah. Um, some vaccines or drugs are contraindicated during pregnancy, like yellow fever vaccine or some anti-malarials and antibiotics. Yeah. So for pregnancy, uh, I need to know that we have no uh good we, we cannot give recommendation because we are we have enough evidence based data in high altitude visitors like us we most of studies have been done in high altitude residents in tibet in the andes Cusco, la paz in lightfield colorado where there are high altitude residents so we have extrapolated recommendation and the uh, so recommendation are, are not really uh, completely clear. 
So I will begin with the physiology of pregnancy. Um, at sea level, you have an increase in ventilation due to progesterone, increase of progesterone and estrogen, and due to increase in metabolic rate. At high altitude, ventilation increases more. There is additive uh, effect of pregnancy and high altitude. So at sea level, PRO2 will increase. And at, at, at high altitude, PRO2 in pregnant women is higher than in non-pregnant women. At sea level, saturation is already maximum. But at high altitude, it is not maximal in non-pregnant women, but it will increase in pregnant women. And the difference between high altitude residents and uh, high altitude visitors is that high altitude residents, depending of uh, the world, but there are genetic different adaptation, but usually may, they may have higher hemoglobin and hematocrit, and so, the arterial content in oxygen is maintained in high altitude residents, but not in high altitude visitors, at least before they have acclimatization and polyglobulia, if they stay enough uh, for enough long time. Cardiac output is increased due to increase in heart rate, in stroke volume, and in plasma volume. It's similar at high altitude, but less marked. Vascular resistance is decreased in pregnancy, and blood pressure is decreased in normal pregnancy. It is similar at high altitude. And uterine artery blood flow increases due to increase in uterine artery diameter and uh, blood flow velocity. It is similar at high altitude, but it is less small. Oh, yes, yes. So, so what happens at high altitude? What, what are the very few recommendations in the already old paper by Susan Neumeyer is a pediatrician from Denver, Colorado. She has written a lot on uh, pregnant women and, and uh, babies at high altitude. Um, due to hyperventilation, uh, with pregnancy and altitude both together, it is very important to tell the pregnant woman to be aware about hydration. And um, about uh, acute mountain sickness incidence, uh, it is the same in pregnant and non-pregnant women. It is even probably better, uh, less incidence in pregnant women due to hyperventilation. But uh, don't repeat it too much because I I I don't uh, want to see some deaths of pregnant women who want to be in the Guinness book. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't have really data. Uh, acetazolamide is theoretically contradicted uh, in the first trimester because it is teratogenic, but it is teratogenic only in rodents. So, <laughs> this recommendation is just a precaution uh, recommendation, safe recommendation, but uh, we have many data, not so many, but we have a few papers of um, acetazolamide in pregnant women given for other indications, neurologic, ophthalmologic. And neurologists and ophthalmologists, they give acetazolamide at much higher um, doses than for uh, prevention of altitude sickness. So, uh, and we have data with no problem. So it is probably secure, but it is not recommended. The, but the conclusion of this is if you know, uh, sometimes pregnant women, they go for tracking, they don't know they are pregnant, as it, as it takes acetazolamide. Okay, you can tell them, it's okay, no problem. Just a normal checkup for your pregnancy, there will be no problem. Okay, be, uh, be confident. Um, acetazolamide is also contraindicated at the end of pregnancy because there are cases of uh, metabolic disorders or increase of neonates jaundice uh, when you take it at the end of pregnancy. 
death. So the main effect of altitude uh, for babies is the decrease of birth weight. So we know that from uh, studies in high altitude residents, uh, many studies were made by Lorna Moore from Denver also, and uh, we know that uh, um, median uh, decrease is about 100 grams per uh, 1,000 meters of altitude. But it is very different due, due to uh, background of the populations because there are some genetic adaptation which begin to be much more recognized. And um, the, for example, the Tibetans, they live for 20, 30, uh, thousand years at high altitude and in about 10, thousand years. European in Colorado about five uh, five hundred years, and Han in Tibet. They have colonized Tibet very recently, and the decrease of birth weight is uh, is uh, correlated with the length of uh, establishment of the population at high altitude. But we have no data for uh, high altitude uh, for high altitude visitors. Uh, this is another example of the difference between Tibetan and Han population. Um, so, uh, what is the, the reason for this uh, intrauterine growth retardation? It is fetal hypoxia, and uh, it uh, it is in the third trimester when the baby uh, uh, has a, the the most important growth. And but to prevent fetal hypoxia, there are some maternal adaptation, and there are some fetal adaptation. Uh, for maternal adaptation, there is an increase of ventilation. Uh, I already told you this. And um, here you can see on the left uh, the difference of ventilation, uh, increase of ventilation due to uh, hypoxia, and in non-pregnant and pregnant women. Hypoxia is altitude, and in pregnant women, you can see that the ventilation is much more increased. Um, and the placenta morphology is different. We, you have a, a bigger placenta compared to the uh, weight of the baby at high altitude, and this is more pronounced in, in uh, high altitude residents, especially it was well studied in Andean women. And uh, also, uterine artery blood flow is more increased in the high altitude population. Here we, you can see the difference between Andean and European uh, uh, women established in, uh, in, uh, in the Andes, in the same area. And uh, the, the European women, they cannot increase their uterine blood flow until the end of pregnancy. And they have babies of lower weight. On the fetal side, there is an increase of erythropoiesis and the increase of the percentage of fetal hemoglobin. Fetal hemoglobin has a higher affinity for um, oxygen. And uh, we have the data at the cord blood, in the cord blood at uh, birth. So, what can we recommend for high altitude visitors? I repeat that we have not really data, base evidence data, but uh, we are very conservative for recommendations. So short stay at moderate altitude below 2,500 meters. Uh, the study, very few studies have been done, uh, some in Colorado and some in Switzerland, uh, already hold. Uh, there is no risk if the pregnancy is normal, if exercise is moderate. And for the mother who are not smoking, say in the Swiss studies, um, the studies were, all the studies were done only in a very small number of women. And they went to high altitude uh, very fast, by cable car, for example, in Switzerland. and. Uh, they are the moderate exercise and they go back. Moderate exercise for a few minutes, they go back. Um, 
only there was uh, problems with the fetal vote only in women who were smokers <laughs> and uh, no other problem but it is not really representative of women who, who are going for tracking um for long stay uh, we know in high altitude residents there uh, there is a higher incidence of preeclampsia placenta abruption fetal death intrauterine growth restriction so um we will recommend uh, to check this. Uh, I will tell you after that. And uh, the risk of exercise is fetal hypoxia or preterm labor. May I quickly ask, what would you consider a short stay or a long stay? Where do we draw the line? Is that a day or more? Oh, short stay. For example, the woman who are going to a ski resort from, for one week. And long stay is a woman who will expatriate in La Paz. So, but uh, so it is uh, there is no clear definition. <laughs> so here, interesting data. Uh, there are case reports, but we have interesting data uh, from La Paz, from uh, American woman. There are data from the doctor from the American embassy in La Paz. It's already old, um, but uh, you see the uh, woman who arrive in La Paz during the first trimester, they have all problems. <laughs> Eclampsia, prematurity, sweetened abortion, and a small, um, uh, small weight of baby, but uh, most were premature, so it's normal. And um, in, if they arrive in second trimester, one had a normal pregnancy, is the other given uh, birth to premature premature baby and but for women who arrived in La Paz before conception the number was six and there was no problem and the birth rate was not was uh, not uh, not bad close to three kilos which is a normal um so we don't have other data what is the problem if you spend your pregnancy in La Paz and you want to give birth at high altitude? We know that in the case of uh, hypotrophic or premature baby, there is an increase of in neonatal mortality and increase also in neonatal morbidity with a higher prevalence of respiratory distresses. Um, another problem is that the cardiopulmonary transition is disturbed by hypoxia. You know, after birth, we have to close the fetal shunts, which which are the uh, ductus arteriosus and foramen ovale. And when we are in hypoxia, it is not possible to close them very fast. So in a high altitude population, there is a higher prevalence of patent ductus arteriosus and patent foramen ovale. ovale. So it can be a risk. Um, supplemental oxygen may be needed uh, for the baby at birth and in the first days for respiratory distress or to help this closure. And uh, in La Paz, there are good clinics, so it is possible to have good uh, health care. And um, there are also a discussion if there is higher risk of sudden infant death syndrome at high altitude. Uh, there is probably a little bit higher risk. And uh, what are the potential later uh, consequences of hypoxia on brain development? Um, it is still controversial, but it is a possibility. So the recommendation. Before travel to high altitude, you need obstetrical advice, gynecologist advice. What is your age? A woman who is 40 years old, maybe it is a little bit more risk in a young woman. What does it mean? Is, is it your first pregnancy? Do you have miscarriages before? Because there is probably a little bit more risk of miscarriage at high altitude or fetal death a little bit later. 
And is it a normal pregnancy? But you need to have ultrasound examination before leaving. If you leave in the first trimester at the beginning of the of the pregnancy, which is usually the case, um, to avoid to go to high altitude with ectopic pregnancy that you don't know, because it can be very dangerous when you are there if you have an accident. Um, do you have a previous experience at high altitude? Uh, some women, they already went to high altitude without any problem. Some women, they want to go to high altitude, they are pregnant. Usually it's because they have planned something, a trek. My last consultation was a woman, young woman. It was her first pregnancy. She was planning to go to Limanjaro. It was a big project <laughs> from one year. But she discovered that she was pregnant just before going. She asked me, can I go there? I ask her, have you already been to high altitude? No, never. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, it is a little bit difficult if you don't know if you will have equipment and sickness or not. OK. Um, she has gone there. And she has uh, she has stopped at the last camp before. She she get, went down because she had headache and uh, OK, but she it was OK. And uh, her, uh, she she has delivered just recently with a perfect normal bed um so do you need if you stay for a long time at high altitude uh you need regular prenatal visits frequent blood pressure and urinary protein checks um for preeclampsia it is after 20 weeks um when i, when I see some women going to la paz uh i tell them go with a automatic uh, uh, device to measure your blood pressure and uh, just bring some uh, uh, bandlets for urinary protein checks so you can be uh, you can do it yourself and before you find your gynecologist there and and be uh, okay mm -hmm. and uh, it is important after 20 weeks when uh, when there is a, a risk of preeclampsia and a risk of uh, on fit on uh, intrauterine growth rotation um, to have a Doppler and ultrasound monitoring to see uterinal uterine artery and umbilical artery workforce and the fetal growth. And if you want to exercise at high altitude, you need a few days before for acclimatization to be sure that you are well acclimatized because there is a risk of competition of the blood flu uh flow uh, between the muscles and the uterus uterus uterine artery so if all the all the blood goes to your muscles and uh, less to uterine artery it's not not good for the fetus and to to bring oxygen and to bring uh, glucose and other nutrients and avoid every exertion after 20 weeks there are some contraindications. If you have chronic hypertension, if you have a heart or lung disease, of course, it is for everybody, not only for pregnancy. Uh, if you have already preeclampsia, don't go higher, don't go to high altitude if you have preeclampsia at sea level. Uh, if you have already impaired placental function at the ultrasound examination, uh, if you have already uh, gross retardation, and uh, anemia if you are anemic it's not a good idea uh, anyway but especially during pregnancy to go to high altitude and for smoking women it is a question okay um uh, you can read it okay so oh, this is uh, Okay, um, so this, after the recommendation we published in uh, 2005, I have written this paper with Lorna Moore and uh, with uh, ask questions to answer specific questions. So you can uh, look at it. And uh, that's all. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dominique. <laughs> I'm and if sure you have question, questions, if you have question, please speak, speak slowly yes. <laughs> and speak with a loud voice because I'm old, I'm deaf, so and <laughs> I don't understand always your English. <laughs> and if you can ask in French, you're you that. And you have one <laughs> yes. Uh, just a comment. Thank you very much for your talk. It was a rare team. And just a comment from a pediatric cardiologist, by the We trained for colleagues from La Paz in German Heart Center to close the patient ductus uh, arteriosus, just in case they, they trained uh, at our lab, in our cat lab, and they go back to La Paz and close this ductus. It's not a problem for the child, but after three years, four years, getting older, uh, it could be a problem. So uh, it's fine to, to see and to hear that um, hypoxia should not a problem to the fetus, but the, the ductal open, uh, it should be closed. So we train them in the past. Okay, thank so, you. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, of course, uh, one short question. Yeah. <laughs> With the uh, fetal growth rate or the growth retardation, um, is there, with the fetal growth rate, you've so shown the graph, um, are there follow ups how these kids develop, whether they would, even though they were born with a lower weight, would they develop completely fine or is there some sort of, you know, retarded growth or? whatever um, development associated with yeah. Okay, I, um, I think uh, the studies were made by Lorna Moore and uh, Susan Niermeyer in Tibet and in, in the Andes. And they, they, I think they didn't have a longitudinal study to, to, to see what happens after. But we know that neonates with low birth rights, they are more at risk for problem after birth and also for later uh, problems during uh, uh, childhood so it's better to have a, a higher weight <laughs> and there, there are many things done where you know children that grow at high altitudes compared to children that grow at low altitudes and you always find a difference in everything you know in in physiological function in uh, in uh, in well-being in cognitive function but it's always a problem what is social economic state that uh, social economic environment and what is really related to low birth weight or some, something like that yeah from an anthropologist's point of view, we know that kids are growing small, uh, are depending on the extent. I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> we know that abnormal babies are born with hypoxia are smaller because of hypoxia, yeah. has any problems with some yeah. the long journey, mm -hmm. uh, have cardiovascular problems, hypertension. And all yeah. sorts of other problems. I don't know if that's an ongoing problem when they are spending my altitude, but and maybe the etiology is different, but hypoxia in pregnancy causes all yes. those problems in the long term. Yes, yes. Into adulthood. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're right. Perfect. <laughs> so, so yes, thank you very much. We will proceed with the next talk. Linda Kies, you have seen before. She's an associate professor at the emergency department of the University of Colorado. She was past president of the Wilderness Medical Society. And she's since long time involved in medical high altitude medical research. And we're happy to have you here too. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Before I start, I also want to give um, extra credit to, um, first of all, the whole team on the UIA Writing Committee, but especially Costa Matakate, who could not be here, but really put in so much hard work on the first draft of the manuscript version of the data or the literature review I'm going to present today.
So if Costa, if you're online, thank you. I guess I should be looking that right there. Okay. Um, yeah, older women, we're still here and we're still the oldest woman to summit Mount Everest is was uh, Tame Wantanabe, who was 73 years old in 20, 2012. And that year she broke the previous record also held by her of the oldest woman who had sold when she had summited at 63. Next slide, please. The oldest woman to summit Mount Kilimanjaro, this is unbelievable, is 89 years old. And she also, she, uh, I think this was in 2019, she had to go back in 2019 at the stunning age of 89 because an 86 year old woman broke her record of 83 years old. And, and by the way, this is not, she's not just the oldest woman who's ever summited Kilimanjaro. She is the oldest person to have summoned Kilimanjaro. Excellent. And then um, this is one of my personal heroes, a fellow Coloradan named Cheryl Crawford, who is still ski mountaineering racing at age 75. And she is alive and well. And I love her quote, there's no one left in my category. <laughs> So that has given me a goal, <laughs> which is to take up schemo racing so I can be in that category someday. Um, so maybe when I retire, I'll take up schemo racing. And then lest you think these are just a few really extraordinary women doing these crazy things, this is my mom, Nancy Keys, a farm girl from Illinois who did the Tour de Mont Blanc on her own um, a few years ago at age 72, also with my children. So yes, older women are going to high altitude and climbing. And I personally have this theory that high altitude living and mountain activities really keep us both feeling, looking, and acting young and if you just look at the senior women on my writing team i you know what more proof do you need really um but there are some theoretical reasons why uh aging might impact how you do at high altitude and so we're going to talk about menopause we're going to talk about how that might affect performance and acclimatization and talk about a couple menopause specific medical conditions namely urinary tract infections and osteoporosis and how that might interact with interact with uh, going to the mountains so menopause is the transitional period that leads to the cessation of menses and uh we heard from Lenka how actually younger women will go to great lengths taking different hormonal contraceptions or the IUD or the depo basically to stop their menses while they're going to high altitude. So this is one benefit of being an older woman who wants to go climbing is we don't have that particular concern to worry about. So menopause, the transition happens because there are cycling decreases in both estrogen and progesterone. And that can lead to symptoms that are we have probably all heard of hot flashes, night sweats, insomnia, mood changes, loss of bone density, and vaginal dryness. How high altitude or low oxygen environment might affect these things is really unknown, and there's not going to be a lot of hard data in the rest of this talk. <laughs> um, but there is kind of this interesting uh, study where researchers asked women in South America and in Spain how many symptoms they experienced in menopause, so hot flashes and night, night sweats, and also how much of it was a problem in their daily lives that they had to deal with menopause. And the women who lived greater than a thousand meters actually had fewer symptoms and felt that menopause was less of a problem. You know, whether this translates into a woman who's in the perimenopause state going to high altitude and having less symptoms than she would at home or overall getting less symptoms, I, I highly doubt. Um, but it's an interesting thing to think about and maybe something to look at. 
Next slide, please. The other thing we really have almost no data on is menopause and performance. It, clearly, it's not impacting my friend Allison Sheets here. She's kicking some butt on a steep ice climb. Um, but really, most of the data we have this comes from some lab stories, studies that I'm going to tell you about in just a minute. But if there's no field studies on older women, and so if there's anyone out there who is interested in organizing a scientific expedition and taking a bunch of us old farts <laughs> up the mountain, <laughs> please come talk to me afterwards because I think there's a lot of great questions we can answer. I'll join you. Okay. <laughs> How we got volunteers? Great. So most of what we know about menopause and performance comes from hypoxic exercise test studies done by Dr. Jean and her colleagues in France. And what they do is they have people breathe a hypoxic gas mixture and then exercise on a bike. And that hypoxic gas mixture is meant to mimic high altitude, but it's normal baric hypoxia, not hypobaric hypoxia, which is what we have at high altitude. The oxygen gas mixture should be equivalent to the summit of Mont Blanc, of course, because these studies were done in France. And, and then they exercise for a few minutes and look at their ventilatory, people's ventilatory responses and their cardiac responses. Mm -hmm. And next one, please. What we can learn from this, I think the main, there's a couple important take home messages. One is that there probably are sex differences in how we physiologically respond to high altitude. So um, as Jacqueline mentioned earlier, the hypoxic ventilatory response to exercise really is a measure of how much our ventilation changes or incre typically increases in response to that hypoxic stimulus. And in, uh, I don't know what happened with my slide, but in men, that hypoxic ventilatory response seems to increase with age, whereas women, it kind of stays the same despite aging. Um, and I don't really know what the clinical importance or significance of that is, but it does tell me that, again, there's probably sex differences in how our bodies adjust to hypoxia. The other important thing they found was that people who were trained, both men and women, their people with greater higher levels of fitness tended to have a better or a higher hypoxic cardiac response to hypoxic exercise, which means that they're, they were better able to increase their heart rate with age if they were better trained. So the untrained people, the older people did worse, but the trained people did better than the untrained people. And so I think just like in low altitude exercise, training is beneficial. And the older we get, the more important that probably is. Next slide. A really important thing that, um, this French group was able to look at was to compare responses in pre and post menopausal women. And in fact, hypoxic ventilatory response to exercise and change in oxygen saturation while breathing that oxygen, that low oxygen gas mixture was really the same whether you were pre or post menopausal. So we've heard a lot today about that respiratory stimulatory effect of progesterone, but maybe this is something that's important in rats or you know lab studies but in the real world i think we're starting to get a collective message here that it probably doesn't make that much difference um, the other thing is some of the postmenopausal women in this study were on hormonal replacement therapy and they had the same kind of results as all the other women too so probably menopausal and hormonal replacement therapy do not affect how we perform on hypoxic exercise tests and i think are unlikely to be really independent of aging an important factor in altitude performance and acclimatization. But so again, you know, okay, if in menopause we have much lower levels of progesterone, so that could theoretically put us at greater risk for acute mountain sickness in for post or us, meaning with postmenopausal women. Um, and there's Again, limited, limited data on this, but also from the, those groups in France. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, before I talk about specifically postmenopausal women, let me just talk about age as a risk factor to answer your question. So this is um, a slide similar to what Dr. Durstein showed you about acute mountain sickness, where we're looking at the number of studies that found age as a risk factor. 
And there were three studies that showed that older age was actually protective. This is that idea that we have our brains shrink and so we have more room for swelling and maybe that means we're less likely to get mountain sickness. Um, there's also three studies that show that older people actually got more mountain sickness than younger people. And then there's four studies that showed that it was really just not an important risk factor. And I have to say that two of those four studies had the greatest number of participants as any of these. These are all observational studies based on like Lake Louise score. And but I I kind of think that the answer is age is probably not important. And and like sex, it's not something we can change. So maybe it doesn't really matter. Next one. But looking specifically at premenopausal versus postmenopausal women, um, uh, this paper, what they did is they compared the incidence of severe AMS. And I actually, I should correct, the, the slide is not exactly correct because it wasn't severe AMS. It was what um, Dr. Dersen mentioned before. And the other thing, it was severe altitude illness. So that included very bad AMS. It included HAVE and it included HACE, although I think there were very few, if any, cases of HACE in this. Correct me if I'm wrong, don't leak. <laughs> and basically, there was really no statistical difference between premenopausal women, postmenopausal women, and postmenopausal women who took hormonal replacement therapy. And although it looks like maybe hormonal replacement therapy, there were a few, a few less, but that group was very small. And so statistically, there's no difference between any of these. These studies were all done on women going to many different places, different high, you know, peak altitudes reached and different as as ascent profiles. There's really no systematic, you know, um, rapid ascent to the same altitude, measure acute mountain sickness within 24 hours <coughs> and have sort of a very systematic solid methodology for looking at this in older women or comparing, I should say, premenopausal to postmenopausal women. So Again, a great research opportunity. <laughs> Next slide, please. So my take home message for this is that uh, acute mountain sickness, the recommendations are gonna be what we already heard from Dr. Durstein. We're not gonna change them based on a climber's age or her menopausal status or whether or not she takes home level replacement therapy. And so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about those medical problems that are specific to older women, and particularly postmenopausal women. And I'm first going to talk about urinary tract infections. <clears throat> we know from epidemiologic data that older travelers in general, and particularly older women, are at greater risk of getting urinary tract infections while they travel. And we also know that you know hygiene is an issue on expedition, but even also mountain trekking or backpacking. And so get, sometimes younger women can be at greater risk of getting a, urinary tract infections in those situations. And then postmenopausal women have the triple whammy of that vaginal atrophy and dryness that we talked about that also increases their risk of urinary tract infection. However, topical estrogen is a highly effective treatment to reduce the frequency of urinary tract infections, stress inc and urge incontinence in postmenopausal women and the severity of urinary tract infections or the occurrence of urinary tract infections. So I think this is something for women to really consider, particularly if they're going on a, a longer trip where hygiene really will, might be an issue. Next slide. So I would say consider topical estrogen, um, especially if you, if a Premenopausal, uh, sorry, postmenopausal woman is known to have frequent urinary tract infections, and this has been a concern for her outside of traveling to high altitude. Then it would definitely be something uh, something to try um, to prevent getting infection while traveling. I also think it's important to carry good, appropriate antibiotics to cover urinary tract infections in your med kit, particularly when you're going to be far from any regular, you know, reliable medical care. So osteoporosis, this is, of course, is a theoretical concern in female climbers because we know that with age in both men, but particularly in women, bone density increases, decreases and the risk of fracture increases. But 
Is high altitude another uh, third factor that might, um, or I, I should say, is high altitude another factor that is going to impact bone density or fracture risk? Sure. So this has only been also looked at in men. So for the ambitious of you, a two to four month expedition with older women to measure their bone density <laughs> could be a great research question. And so these studies were all done, as I said, from over two to four months of men on expeditions or working in a high altitude location. And bone density decreased, not by a huge amount, but by enough, and other markers of bone health also decreased. And so this raises the question that maybe this is a con should be a concern for women too. And I really just think we need solid data to be able to answer the question. But we also know that weight-bearing activity is really important for bone health. So all those mountain activities that we love to do, hiking, trail running, orienteering. This is Sharon Crawford again. She's actually in her 70s on the U.S. orienteering team, national yeah. team. This is her like winning a race up in Matterhorn. Um, so we have to weigh that concern about fracture, loss of bone density, or you know, trauma risk versus the benefits that it might be actually to do mountain activity when you're older to keep your bones healthy. Next slide. So if a woman has known osteoporosis or osteopenia <clears throat> has had an osteopenic fracture in the past and is on treatment for that, of course, continue that. And you know, does high altitude affect how those medicines work? And nobody has any idea. Um, and you know, women should be cautious if you're gonna, especially women who have known osteoporosis, if you're gonna be doing an activity that puts you at risk for falling and potentially getting a fracture. So, like always, double and triple check your knots. But remember that those mountain activities actually are probably good for your bone health and will increase your bone density and increase bone strength. And I also think that the benefits for your mental health and our general well-being of being in the mountains has to outweigh that like theoretical concern of fracture and falling for people like you know the women in this room we're really mountain people right this is what makes us happy and no one's going to be happy sitting at home saying i wish i could be up there but i'm worried i'm going to break my head so to summarize the specific considerations um prevent and treat urinary tract infections as appropriate caution around that risk of trauma, particularly if there's known osteoporosis. But again, let's think about the beneficial effects of mountain activity. And overall, next slide, please. We recommend that women of all ages participate in mountain activities. And there's, we need more research to understand the impacts of aging and of hormonal fluctuations and, and changes for high altitude performance and um, female specific health female specific mountain health. So the message is keep climbing. Are there any questions? Maybe there's a point for me to discuss a bit. We we talk now a lot about hypoxic ventilatory response and this is very uh, a, a huge stimulus and probably overrides also any hormonal um, regulation of ventilatory response. But in all these studies, we miss the CO2 impact because this is very important in, in how much you can ventilate is your CO2 level. And it's quite difficult to as assess both of them. Um, but it, all the time, we just look just at one side and that's maybe also why we don't find any consistent results. Yeah, it's a really important point. Thank you. So maybe also a bit oh. tired, yeah. but now we have, Do you have yeah, question? just one question, Bruce. Um, well, I, <clears throat> I feel like it's, I want to go back to the old discussion we had about behavioral factors, because mm -hmm. I would like to think that as we get older, we get smarter or at least a little bit more careful. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, you think that the risk, since you find that the distribution is flat with age, is it actually that physiologically we are at more risk as we get older, but we also get smarter so we don't show up on them? <laughs> <laughs> what's the saying? There are 
old oh. climbers and there's bold climbers, but there's no old bold climbers. How do you measure smartness? Yeah. Could we said to many number of small accidents you can have as a function of time or something. I don't know. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah, it's, it's, good. it's, it's a very interesting. Question. It's just that, so, yeah, how do we deconvolve the behavioral aspect? Yes. Mm -hmm. I have a comment on behavioral stuff, which I'll yes. probably say for dinner, but right. it's. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that yes. that's a big discussion. Yes. We'll have more of that. Afterwards. That's, that's true, but of course, we lose of our physiological reserve with, with age. And if you have a very huge reserve in the beginning, it doesn't matter that much. And for a huge part of us, it matters when you get older, you have less reserve, so you're more at risk at the end. So it's probably there are also several factors. Right. So we will press. Linda, yeah. Linda, one, one more question. This loss of bone mass that impresses me quite a bit because, you know, just going on an expedition, you lose so much bone mass. Mm -hmm. So how long were those, those studies? Um, what the one of the highest I, I can't remember which is which now. I'm sorry because I'm old and my memory is bad. But um, the 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 maximum time was four months, but there was two okay. to four months, right. and I don't remember if the lower ones were the shorter time and the long, longer ones were the longer time. We can look that up afterwards. I'm sorry, I can't remember. Okay. So we need to plan our expedition at least two months. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right. So whoever's doing the logistic portion of that is well, Shall we have a list that we can subscribe to? Yeah. And we need we make a list for everybody who wants to participate. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll pass the hat to start the funding. <laughs> Thank you very much, okay. Linda. It was really nice. So the last talk we'll see. Another one. Lucy. So, yes, you already know her. She's a pediatrician. She, she's a sports physician. She's professor at the Institute of Epidemiology of the University of Zurich. And she has a lot of experience with children, but with herself being mm -hmm. women uh, at altitude. So, yeah, just the thank, you. Is yours. Thank, thank you. Thank you. You know, just get up for two minutes because I see that both swim there, get up, and we do some exercise together. <laughs> so you you take the head, you turn the head a bit. I cannot. You, go the, you know, yeah, that's good. Absolutely good. And so you make noise. You take the, the shoulders and go back <laughs> Just turn them a bit. <laughs> yes, and you take the arms out, and so you go. Good. Now, bend the knee. <laughs> Everybody ever. <laughs> okay. So um again, um you know thanks. So it's good. So uh, again, a big thanks to Kaste who can't make couldn't make it here. She has helped to get together all this data, what I show you here. So I talk about, you know, in the beginning, I should have talked about injuries and death at high altitude. Is, are there women specific um, difference, uh, are there differences between women and men? And then I had to reduce the topic because injury, it's just an endless story. And I mean, the database of just looking at injuries in the mountains, it's so bad that you end up with just a mess. Some case series somewhere in the world, you know, not knowing where they come from, what they did exactly, just injury somehow, not even defined what is injury. So I decided to leave this topic and just go for those two things, namely for frostbite and for mortality, because there is some data 
where we can say something. Yes. So next, I'll give it to you. Okay. So just to uh, give you a bit the um, the background, obviously um, fr um, frostbite is a direct freezing injury, and you know the skin has to freeze below the temperature of three degrees of Celsius or you know the respective Fahrenheit and obviously most uh, commonly affected feet hands and um the, the and the head I mean the face um but and the exposure times they vary tremendously it can be some minutes or it can be hours and every you know you can have the same injury um that goes on yes next okay, okay. that's good so just to to give you a little overview i don't go into details but there are like dif different degrees of freezing injuries and that makes it really difficult to look at the literature but what you see on the left hand side that's frost nips or the chill plants what what's called also these are you know the mildest form of injuries and we don't call that in a way frostbite or frostbite grade one but we have a recovery a full recovery so what we are interested in this um more severe forms of freezing injury injuries and um, where we need to um, consider prevention measures as much as possible. And you see how awful this is. You know, I mean, it's it's unbelievable if you end up with such feet because you did not take the right measures when you go to to the mountains. Just to so factors predisposing for frostbite you see a long list and i put in yellow whatever or can you know what are the main major risk factors at high altitude and you see how many things that can happen in common or just one of uh, of this and one of the most um, important um, factor is of is the the wind chill and you see a so-called wind chill temperature um, index and you see on the um here you have the temperature in degrees celsius and then you have the, the wind so in a way if you have very little wind and you have uh, a temperature of minus 20 you end up with have a true um, exposure of the skin of 24 degrees and if you have minus 20 and you have a strong wind then you end up with far lower uh, temperatures that even increase tremendously the risk of because of having a uh, freezing injury um we know you know like in this we know that the risk increases with increasing wind and decreasing temperature and you know there is a, a paper that tells that it's the the, the cutoff at altitude is um 5000 meters but before um this is a, a great paper where um um engineers looked at um what the risk is with these different wind chill temperatures at uh, different elevations um at on the on the peak of mount everest so on the peak in a in a summer ascent of everest you usually have temperatures of minus 30 degrees and then you know what is usually measured is this freeze the facial freezing time so that means you know when do you get a frozen cheek or a frozen nose and on the summit of everest you have a mostly minus 30 degree and so you have a freezing time of about 18 minutes which is really low if you if you think about how long these people spend above 8000 meters um, you have to make sure that you really cover your face and make sure that you also look at each other and prevent that freezing injuries occur. 
And in May, that most and at the at the time where most summit attempts uh, occur, you have wind chill temperatures of minus 45. That means that facial freezing time go, drops down to seven minutes. And in winter, I mean the extreme version, you have just one minute time to prevent freezing of your face. So it's it's tremendous what you um what what the low temperatures re re really um apply to um to the risk on, on the face. And this is what's happening uh, at high altitude. This is a, a, a Pakistan study where uh, people uh, have looked at the incidence of frostbite at different related to altitude. And what you can see is that there was a marked increase in frostbite incidents um, from 5,000 meters on. And this is exactly what's happening where the, the big drop of temperature takes part and where the big increase in wind take part. And it's also, you know, uh, you also have to consider the season where you look at these injuries and you have the highest injuries at the lowest temperature seasons, obviously, it during winter time. So, if you look at frostbite in general populations or hospital admissions, we have a single study that was done in altitude where male were had a higher incidence than female so that's women and men and and this is a uh, national registry data um, register of alpine accidents in austria where they looked at sea level residents rescued by austrian alpine police and they could find an incidence of male to female ratio of four to one. And all the other studies have been done at low altitude. Mm. That was not an exposure at high altitude. And even in this study, we don't know how high up they were to uh, obtain those frostbites. And, you know, in red, if you go over, these are really population based studies. They are well done and they're population based where you have really female and male in, in, in these cohorts. You have mostly the male predominance of frostbite occurrence. And this goes through most of the, of the literature in this population based um studies on the other side we have also some studies where men were equally affected than women or women were even more affected than men and there we have another uh, study that has really been done at high altitude where it, it was the Tehran Mountaineering Association where they did a survey over two years period and ask every mountaineer who has been several times in uh, at altitudes from two eight to seven one thousand meters of altitude um, whether they got frostbite and there was no significant significant relation between age and sex and frostbite incidents. And then we have a good evidence from army. Army have. Uh, army, um, especially the US Army, they have excellent data, prospectively um, assessed data, where we have a bit uh, a various picture over, you know, depending on when it was measured, it was assessed. But here we had a clear predominance of frostbite in women in two really um, periods of time measured. Um, two times in here, it was a period of, uh, of 2008 to 2000, uh, 2002 to 2008. And this one was a registry of over the, the last 10 years. And there is an old study 
um, where they found no difference between male and female. So whatever you want. I, I mean, it's you see, you have a, a very different picture. Um, we have sex differences in frostbite incidents at high in a high altitude inconclusive in favor of men in population based studies in cold countries and in favor of women in military surveys. So what are we doing with that? So very, very complicated. So I, you know, my conclusion is we have no clear evidence of sex differences in frostbite because it's so variable. But we have some questions to ask. In these population-based studies, very often we had a much higher op occupational exposure in the males. So we don't know what does, what does this on incidence differences among um, female and male. We have a total lack of gender differentiated exposure data, um, you know, when it comes to how how many times they have been in the cold and how long times they have been in the cold and so on. And then we have a plethora of risk factors. They confound these findings, uh, you know, like um, body fat comp composition. We know fat is, is really conserving heat dissipation. Muscle my mass can increase body temperature that increases uh, core temperature. Physical activity helps to prevent that we have a, a, a decrease in peripheral um, perfusion. And finally, eating helps to have really thermal genesis going on. And then the last point where, you know, we always have to talk about is that, you know, we have a different physiology, but we also have a different behavior in women and men. And it's impossible to weigh out the relative importance of factors to define the risk and to see really whether we have a difference between men and women. So for now, um, um there is no difference and irrespective or you know irrespective what we do what we find it's very very clear that warm proper dry clothing with multiple layers help to prevent cold injuries prevention of dehydration and starvation um, prevention of immobility and general good physical fitness that improves peripheral um, perfusion um, may reduce the risk of hypothermia and frostbite. And these are also the recommendations we will give. The second topic is mortality. So you see death rates increase with increasing altitudes, but the causes of this vary not only related to altitude, but also related to envi envi environmental conditions like avalanche, rock, ice, difficulties in climb, use of oxy oxygen exp expedition style, and very often causes of death are unclear because mo the most often um, it's a fall but we don't know whether the fall is related to high altitude illness, whether it's to, related to fatigue or other factors that might interact. You see here the causes of death in the Himalayans. Um, thanks to the database of Billy and Co. Uh, you know, we have this data. Mm -hmm. huh? Yes, exactly. So you see here the altitude on the on the x axis and how many um, uh, deaths we have, and if you take all this, it's increasing with altitude, and then it, it drops probably because the exposure is less high, and you have in the lower part you have a predominance of avalanches, and in the in the higher parts you have more falls. Probably this is a mixture of high altitude illness and fatigue that occurs. 
If you go lower down on Denali, you have also a lot of calls and you have, I was really impressed to see that high altitude illness is so little in relation to other factors, you know, but maybe it's also because falls cover, you know, many, many cases of high altitude illness. And that's why we, we are not sure really. And on Kilimanjaro, it's mostly high altitude illness. Most cases we have there because it's not dangerous to go up to Kilimanjaro. So we have mostly, um, you know, high altitude illness that kills people on Kilimanjaro. In general, um, we have some data for the Himalayas for Denali, Kilimanjaro, Aconcagua, Agua. And the general picture is that we like, we have an increased participation of climbers over time. That Jacqueline um, told that already. So you have, we had in the fifties, we had 5% of women climbing, um, climbing the Mount Everest or the Himalayas. And now we have about 15% of climbers that make up women. That means exposure goes up. We have overall in all mountains where that has been shown less death over time. So it has become um, more secure climbing. We have less deaths with use of oxygen. So if you go um, on Everest, and you measure individual, individual mountaineers. Um, here you have the number of ascents and the number of deaths. So with yeah, the use of supplementary ex oxygen, you have 3% death. No um, supplementary oxygen, you have 8% of death. And the same holds true if you look at whole teams. Um, you still have a protective um, uh, factor of oxygen. And this is even more striking for the K2. So here you have zero uh, um, percent death with the use of oxygen versus 18%. Um, now, when it comes to death rates, where we compare gender, you see uh, in all all um, heights and on all mountains, we have death rates in favor of the male, except for the Mount, uh, for the Everest region and the Himalayas. And I'm still, you know, if you go there into detail uh, again with the um, on the database of of um, Mrs. Holly and Billy, then you see that the total death, you see here all peaks death rates, and then you see 8,000ers, 7,000ers, 6,000ers, you see an increased death rate in men versus women if you take all peaks, and you see a tremendously increased death rate on 7,000 or peak where you have a total uh, a male death rate of two and you have a 0 0.3 female death rate so overall we have also a predominance of male death so okay and if you go at lower altitudes and you look at different mountaineering activities, you can see them here on the list. You also, um, you have death rate, you have the number of deaths, uh, the ages, but you also have a tremendous male predominance um, in death rates um, at lower altitudes. So what do we do out of that? We have good epidemiological data of the Himalayans, that's for sure, but we don't have good um, epidemiological data on other peaks like Kilimanjaro, Denali, and um, Aconcagua, and European Alps. And 
even less so for sex specific exposure data it's just very very poorly reported except yeah. for the lines and for the database we have from there and i you know it's my my inner inner thought is always isn't it behavior possibly um you know explaining this male predominance in death that uh, women um and and or is it something else and we have confounders like use of oxygen um women choose security before risk or they might also choose an easier route and we have some evidence that this takes place so in the general lit literature where we look at different behaviors in men versus women we have all these things in that are more common and more dominant in men than women and if we transpose that to this graph of um Weinbuch et al he looked at female participant fraction and here and mortality per thousand expedition members so here you have a high mortality and here you have a low mortality and he could really show that if you have a low mortality on the mountain you have the relative um, participation of women is much higher than if you have a high risk of dying on the mountain I mean, it's cross-sectional, but it would really underline what we see here and what we see in the epidemiological data. And it's open to discuss, and I'm, I'm very, very curious what you say um, in respect of this idea. But my conclusion is um, death at high altitude seems to occur more often in men than women, but gender separated exposure data and every environmental risk factors are often lacking and for you know my wish would be to have more standardized death registries all over the world which would not be so so difficult to establish and you know i mean so to the key recommendations might be choosing low risk mountains with a low death rate may be a wise to reduce mortality risk. And finally, female mountaineers may consider the use of supplementary oxygen for climbing peaks above 8,000 meters. I'm well aware of the environmental uh, problems uh, that go with it to reduce not only mortality risk, but also freezing injuries because we know that supplemental uh, oxygen is really um, dilatating vessels and also preventing cold injury. So many thanks for. What? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for presenting relishing the database that'll make me believe that I have to carry on with uh, yeah, well, definitely needed for medical research absolutely but anyway um you've just now mentioned the supplemental um, oxygen. oxygen yes because for me I mean I see a lot of frostbite and I don't correct me if I'm wrong I'm not medical I don't see a difference between male and female yeah okay without oxygen people have a lot you know, as you know, the blood gets thicker. I mean, in, in right. the, the frostbite, I mean, most frostbite we see when people come back without supplementary right. oxygen. Um, I mean, yeah. So, I, I, and I wouldn't, I don't think I would necessarily say men and women. I mean, I, right. you know, I don't, I, I don't see that at all. I mean, we see frostbite, yes. of course, you know, with people, you know, using supplemental oxygen, but I suppose it's also, and that goes in your, your, your fact, you know, about being careful and being, you know, I look at Galinde. Galinde has been over 8,000 meters 22 times or 24 times, never used supplemental oxygen. She has nothing. nothing. So very, very careful. But, you know, that's, Absolutely. You know, that's her. But I do also agree that maybe women are 
yeah, maybe we are a little bit more more careful. Right. I think oxygen use is a huge, makes a huge difference in cost. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I had the chance to read this uh, article before, so it was really something I was wondering, shouldn't we just say in the key recommendation, all planners, yeah. yes, female planners, yes. I think it's the exclusion of male that we know, sure. we should just say all planners. Yes, right? we can do that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, as a forensic pathologist, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Cases since 2003. Okay. And there are uh, yeah, the, the number of uh, male fatalities is much more higher. It's higher. It's 80 something percent. Right. And and I think concerning the causes of death, we have the big big problem that there are just a few autopsies done. So we have no clear data about the causes of death, and it's very often an assumption. Yes. Uh, what was the reason that they died, and what happened before? Was yes. there a uh, hape or something, or was there an infarction, or whatever that they that they, that they fell? Yes. And uh, the last thing concerning the risk behavior, I think we have quite good numbers for all the base jumpers in the Lauterbrunn Valley, and I mean there are mostly men. And also, if you have a look at the death cases, there are also nearly just men dying in the Lauterbrunn Valley during mm -hmm. base jumping. Yeah. There are just two or three females. Yeah. Yes. Just when I think with my scientific part of my brain, until now, we have always discussed behavior as a confounder. Right. So it's a cofactor or whatever. Why shouldn't we focus on behavioral sciences? Absolutely. Absolutely. We need much more to do that in this respect. Yes. We don't understand it. So, and you know, I tell you, so, like, like we have some females and Billy, you, you might know, be aware of, you know, we have, um, we have like, I'm aware of three women who climbed K2 in previous years and all this three women, they were not normally behaving because they had small kids at home and they climbed K2 and somehow they died. And this is not the normal behavior of females, you know, at, you know, going really even to there. climb, even there. And um, yes. next climbers who stop climbing a thousand meter feet. Yes. And they have children. Yes. So what I learned about behavior now mm -hmm. and about maybe the future, because still not that many women are going to the high altitude. We have for tomorrow, we have here our female mountain guide, mm -hmm. Anna She's a doctor and yes. coming a mountain guide. She's in her last uh, step, I think. So what do you think? If you see your colleagues now, women, men, you know, we are the future. Do you think really that it's a behavior question? What if you compare with you, you have to do difficult things, you do crazy things. So what do you think about this discussion as a young mountain guy? It's yes. a hard one, I think. Yes. It's hard to say, but yes, I would say it's a behavioral thing. Yeah. Because I think much more me or with the, with the now with the guide, um, guide class is much more men go, even if they're not up to the, up to the level and with colleagues going for or, or colleagues, women colleagues going to the mountain for a long time, having in a higher level and thinking they're not able to do it and then seeing the men. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really a behavioral mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, please. So uh, and myself being a climber and having uh, guided expeditions, uh, from my, my experience, uh, climbers come into a pressure, as I said earlier as well, that they come with a lot of uh, burden, like sponsors and media and so much expectations, and they become so stubborn, like they, they're uh, physically, mentally, they're, they're not able to do it. But then back in their mind, they think, okay, I need to answer, you know? So they just keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing until like either the rest of the team members have to compensate and help the person to get to the top and bring back safely or just abandon the person up on the mountain and let him or her to die. So that, that's something I have with it myself sometimes. Yeah. So I would, you know, who is for 
<laughs> the hypothesis that it's male behavior that makes them die more often than female. Well, you couldn't turn it around. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It would make them much safer. Yes. Okay. Well, I, I mean, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Let's turn it around because so it's a safer way of behaving uh, in the mountains of the female that makes it makes her protect or them protect from dying in the mountain who is in favor of that the mountain guy says to walk as well <laughs> <laughs> and who is uh, who thinks that it's it has nothing to do with behavior it's just yeah. Just case by case. Yes, case by case. You know, leading the team, but uh, and we, he, he or she might bring them in the other place and um, just uh, being a uh, um, this for yeah, just happens like some of the mountaineers like who are considered the greatest in their countries. Yes, yes. So many instances where I almost lost my life. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah. Completely like one person's behavior um, in general, but situation yes sure yes it's maybe also difficult we have now discussed about sex differences yes in fact we're discussing about gender differences so it has a lot to do how we are grown up and so on and it's very difficult to put all women and all men in one in one so yes maybe just to yes yes just very very quickly i mean i agree with you i think also the pressure you know, I mean, I do agree, you know, I'm sort right. of split. I yes. Think, yes, there is, there is <laughs> behavior between men and women, but also the pressure, you know, once you make your money with mountaineering, right. you know, it's you different not story. Your life, yes. whatever, all of yes. the responses. Yes. And you need to perform. And then, you know, if Facebook, Instagram, yeah. blah, 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 yeah. you, I, I think that also puts right. so much more pressure. Right. You mm -hmm. see all these young people I've yeah. talked about before, yeah. and they, it's all, wow, you know, look at me, I've done K2 and yeah. in yes. in half a day. So that was one last statement. So. From a new logical point of view, I'd like to remind you that the frontal lobe in them and <laughs> taking a risk and planning is all frontal lobe function is only at its full size with, at the age of 27. Yes. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes. So, so, so I think I, I, you know, before you talk, I want to thank you. That is <laughs> You know, although you are a man, you made it possible <laughs> that we can be here and we can have this wonderful, you know, time up here and wonderful discussion. And we hope that it's not the last time that we come together in this you know, group. Thank you. And hello also to the virtual audience. We see Alison is here too. She's also a member of this working group and would have a talk on behavioral <laughs> factors as well. And we hope we hear you live the next time when we repeat this uh, Congress. Angelini Corrado. Wow. from South Africa. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fascinating, fascinating talks. Thank you. <laughs> Corrado. Wow. So maybe from you both closing words before I Yeah, it was really inspiring. The discussions, the talks, and yeah, to have you all here. Yes. And and I think all the speakers will be at the dinner table and, you know, you can go there and ask nasty or nice questions. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and we really try to have this discussion round up. And I think that's really interesting and important that we have this interaction. And 
especially in this era where it's not high evidence, it doesn't exist. So uh, we, we need to have good ideas to um, make the next steps. So before we come to an end, we would say bye-bye to the online community. Bye-bye. <laughs> Alison, can I just make a comment? Because oh, sure, it, sure. Sorry, Alison. Um, Absolutely. You have kept me spellbound for six hours of virtual conference, wow. and that is a world record, definitely. <laughs> and what I could feel from here is what I think we've uniquely created in the first episode of what must now become an annual event, which is a coziness and an ability, as Susie just said, showed us to take a risk with proposing a new hypothesis to a room and full credit to the organizers and the presenters beautifully done you kept us enthralled world record i'd say in holding attention over six hours on zoom thank you mm -hmm. <laughs> so Thank you to the online community. We go coming back a few um, things I have to say. Well, first of all, sometimes it's not so bad being a man taking some risk because as I planned this conference,